So thank you, Elisa, for uh, for the possibility to talk, to talk to such a large audience, and for everybody who uh, who came to listen to me. Uh, the weather in Warsaw is now uh, 34 degrees centigrade, humid, so it's very unpleasant. I think uh, it's 10 degrees warmer than in Barcelona, more or less. So something strange happens with the weather. Uh, I will speak about uh, Bermudian swaption. So that's, uh, that's the subject I'm working on for the last Okay, if we include optimal stuffing time, that was my PhD around 40 years ago. So that's a long time. Uh, okay, so this is a joint work uh, by myself together with Julius Jabłecki. So my collaborator now independent with independent position. So I must find some other PhD students. Uh, so I will tell you something on the interest rate market and the general methodology uh, in this area. Then uh, review a bit tell you a bit uh, how to price Bermuda and what, is, what are Bermudan swaptions, what are swaptions, what are Bermudan swaptions, and how they are priced in practice. Say a few words about the curse of dimensionality and then finally present some idea which is, a, I would say, a bit heuristic. So that's on the Border on of mathematics. We I don't know if I'm mathematician, a mathematician, but what I currently do is on the border of mathematics. So I rather use mathematics as a tool. Don't solve mathematical problems, but problems who come from the real life, from business, using mathematics and paying some tribute, but still uh, being independent on that. So sometimes I uh, intentionally violate mathematical rigor. And this will happen today. Okay, so the, our research is based on five papers. Two of them are very old, so 20 years in the area of mathematical finance is, is quite a long, and three of them are quite recent. Uh, yes, so some stylized facts. When we take a look at a uh, quantitative finance or mathematical finance or finance and stochastics. So some other most important journals in mathematical finance, we will uh, see that 90% of the research is about pricing in the research of option pricing deals with uh, equity or FX option. But when we look at the real world, how the markets look like, we will see quite um, in the 90s, the interest rate options were quite popular in research. But then uh, it stopped. So there is uh, a few papers per year. 
in the area. Although I think not everything is, is done. So there are quite many interesting subjects. So uh, when we look at the real world, we will see that proportion is reversed. So the volume of uh, derivatives of even options is 90% are interest rate options and 10% other classes. Both on the exchange traded uh, exchange markets or over the counter market. Uh, why it is so? Because fixed income is the core business of banks. So banks, of course, may trade some uh, some other products, but the core business of banks is just credit deposit. So dealing with time value of money. And uh, equity options, uh, interest rate options are just traded for to make money. So, uh, But uh, even now, it's uh, a side activity of banks. So just, just before of the crisis, because now regulators don't want uh, banks to take unnecessary risks. But uh, banks per se as themselves are exposed to interest rate risk. So they don't have to trade anything. They are just exposed to interest rate risk. So they have to, cal to calculate option prices and uh, so on. So every collable product, so a collable deposit, a collable credit is in fact uh, an interest rate option. So uh, even if hedge funds don't find any business in uh, interest rate trading, the, this will be, this will exist uh, as a uh, hedging of core business of bank. So, and, from the other point of view, I think it's intellectually very, very interesting. So, okay, it's my very personal opinion, but uh, interest rate derivatives from in intellectual point of view are more interesting than uh, uh, equity options. Okay, I, I will try to convince you maybe. So, what is the basic framework of uh, pricing of interest rate uh, options? This is called AJM after three researchers, uh, David Heath, uh, Robert Jarrow and Andrew Morton. So uh, Andrew Morton was the PhD candidate. Uh, David Heath, uh, late David Heath was his supervisor and Robert Jarrow was the referee. So I'm not suggested who did 90% of the work. I'm not saying about that, but I think have a view. And uh, this framework is on one hand based on the benchmark created by Black and Shot. So, namely, the concept that uh, arbitrage free pricing is from mathematical point of view, 
uh, marching grail pricing. So a uh, process must be a marching grail in order to have a risk neutral measure. And with respect to this measure, we calculate some expected values, and these are and these are the prices we are looking for. On the one hand, but on the other hand, is orto this is orthogonal to the Black and Scholes equation. So we don't deal with the uh, with the Black and Scholes or Samuelson dynamics. We've got some other equations. So more difficult. So namely, uh, B of T. This is a price of zero coupon bond. So little t is the current date. Capital T is the bond maturity. And B is the price of uh, zero coupon bond. Zero coupon, so with no coupon. The contract looks like that, that at time capital T, we get one dollar or one euro. And of course, such, uh, such an obligation got a price. And this price is what exactly uh, B of little t capital T. And of course, uh, we assume that uh, life is grand. So everything is different, shabu, integrable, uh, all theorems, mathematical theorems hold. So uh, of course, uh, how we do mathematics. First, we write down some formula and then find conditions up under which they hold. So this is, this is normal approach. I assume everything is as regular as we want. So if we assume that uh, B of, uh, of T is different shabu, we, we've got this logarithmic, uh, logarithmic derivative of B and call it forward short trade. Why so or forward trade? Why so? We'll see in the further part of the talk. Uh, that guy will be called short trade, and that is represents the current situation. So when uh, the after the death of infamous like libel. We've got only overnight rates in the market, in the interbank market. So on the very short time period, bank lent each other money for overnight. So this is exactly that rate. And that's the uh, benchmark for our loans, deposits, all the credit activity of the bank. And that was the celebrated uh, Higgjaro Morton theorem that the bond market is arbitrarily uh, if and only if the instantaneous forward rates follow that equation. So that is, uh, that was proven some 30 years back. Identically as in the case of uh, Black and Schultz papers, so they had serious problems in publishing that paper. So I knew about this result before it was published. 
Uh, and that's, some people say the second uh, important result in the field of quantitative finance. The, don't read the paper itself. It's the worst written paper on earth. So find uh, rather uh, a book where it is clear and well presented. In fact, that that reason is that that result is not very difficult. So the chief general Morton condition is the condition for this uh, drift term. And as you know, when you've got some experience in quantitative finance, uh, creating risk-free measures consists practically of determining drifts for some stochastic equations in order to get something and mar uh, a martingale. And that's exactly how this condition is proven. Okay, so we are now in the very, very beginning of our route into pricing of interest rate derivative. Re interest rate derivatives let us uh, step into describing the market. So, uh, but before, maybe a brief comment, what's the difference between the, uh, the Black and Schultz framework and Keith Jarrell Martin. So, in the Black and Schultz framework, we've got dynamics of a number. Yes, it's the underlying price, equity, exchange rate, something like that. So uh, a point moves up and down. But here, we don't have a We've got a one dimensional object, a line which moves up and down. So that's not only up and down, but it may rotate and move, uh, move uh, any other way, like uh, butterfly rotation, movement up and down, and all the others. So that's conceptually difficult. So maybe mathematics uh, for that is, is not that difficult because we are still within the, the framework of uh, stochastic analysis, but even at least for a while, we must move our mind into the field of infinite dimensional uh, into dynamics on infinite dimensional object into stochastic partial differential equation. So that's, uh, that was uh, maybe a problem, maybe not for mathematicians, but, but for early uh, researchers in the field of quantitative finance, which had the quite often background in economics. So uh, American economists are much better educated as mathematicians, as European ones, but still uh, are not so fluent in infinite dimensional objects. Okay, so let's uh, let's define uh, let's define the interest rate product. So the first most popular interest rate product is a swap. So we just exchange fixed coupon for float coupon. 
So that's a linear product. There is no mathematics behind practically. Uh, although the product, of course, is the most traded uh, interest or even any, any financial derivative. But when we go to options, when a product is liquid, there appear options on it. So uh, swap option is an option on swap. Swap option or swap option. So American slight linguistic jokes. So how to define the swap option price? So here we've got the zero coupon bond price. This is the continuously compounded. In practice, in practice, this is not continuously compounded, but we are mathematicians, so we prefer uh, differential equations than difference equations. So this is the annuity from little t is the option maturity and capital T swap maturity. And forward swap rate is defined so. So on the above, we've got float rate and below the fixed rate. And R of T is just uh, compounding, no, discounting because it's fees discounting from uh, little t to capital time, little t to capital T. So that just represents uh, if we make the deposit of one dollar, okay, let, let it be Europe, we are in Europe. Uh, one euro today at time little t, we will have this amount of money and uh, at time t. No, not this, but one over this, because uh, minus should be counted. And uh, European call option price is equal to this expectation. So, here we've got the option payoff, which is a positive part of some difference. So you've seen many times. Here we've got the discounting. And we add this part, this annuity here, what, will, what represents that uh, the payoff unlike in the equity derivatives case, will be paid off not just at, up, at the option maturity, but every day or say every quarter uh, from option maturity to the swap maturity. And one thing that you should keep in mind, is that we've got three numbers here. So it's a three parameter family, strike price, option maturity, swap maturity. And this is the, how uh, the Bloomberg terminal tries to visualize uh, this three parameter family on two, two dimensional screen. So, Okay, it, it may be when you learn to read it, you will be able. And uh, Darius, yeah. can I ask you a question? Yes, yes. These products are liquid. Uh, swaption, uh, swaptions. Yes. More liquid than any any equity product. Okay, thank you very much. More liquid, uh, so swaps, okay, swaps were not uh, put into this 
this picture because they are not that intellectually challenge, challenging. So I've got options only here, but swaps are 90, say interest rate swaps, 90. No, but I don't mean swaps, I mean swaptions. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but swaps, uh, interest rate swaps are say 95% of the okay. volume of everything what's traded. Okay. And uh, of course, swaptions, since something is very liquid, so options on that must be. And uh, why interest rate uh, products are more liquid than equity? equity products that's just simple uh, simple reason because there are only few kind you've got many stocks thousands okay. or even millions of stocks and currencies are practically two okay maybe say four or five but not many uh, and uh, since we've got optionality in terms that practically any interest rate product is callable, you may make a term deposit in your bank and call that break, uh, call that product at some, uh, some stage. You may take a loan and repay it before maturity. So there is a lot of collaboration in the interest rate market. So uh, Bermuda or American swaptions are also a very liquid and almost uh, almost vanilla product. Uh, what is Bermuda? Of course, you've read it, you've heard it before that Bermuda is between America and Europe, so the uh, collab products, but not at every maturity. But from mathematical point of view, Bermudans, Bermudan products are not much different from American ones. So when we discretize uh, an American option, in practice, we get a Bermudan option. Uh, so how it looks from the uh, not mathematical, but practical point of view. We've got a one-dimensional family of options, not three-dimensional, but one-dimensional. So options with a number of maturities, and we choose the best, best of them, yes? So we exercise the option of at uh, we decide which option we are going to get payoff and over. It's the game is over. Of course, we don't uh, make this decision in advance, but we look what happens in the market and bam, we decide. Uh, to exercise the option. So that's uh, also a very classical and uh, known control problem called, probably the simplest one called uh, optimal status. There are many papers in this area, which is, I think, almost that everything was, was solved in the 50s, in the 60s. Uh, so how we deal with, uh, from practical point of view, we deal with uh, optimal stopping problems. So practically all the stochastics, applied stochastics consist of uh, Markov potential theory. So we take a random dynamics of something, then try to find within that with some hidden parameters, maybe a Markov process, 
and then use relations between Markov processes and uh, partial differential equations. So, uh, part uh, integral differential equations. Because when we've got jumps, you must uh, introduce integral equations. And that's, that's all. We can't uh, invent anything better, but we try sometimes to, to cheat the, the reality and uh, to solve something uh, above the Markovian condition. Uh, and this is, okay, so you see on the screen what I just said, that we find uh, an n-dimensional stochastic process, Markov stochastic process, and then find, uh, uh, solve the optimal stocking problem for this process, which from mathematical point of view consists of finding a few boundary. So we've got here maximum before uh, of uh, stopping function and continuation function, because at every time we decide, do we stop now or not? We let the process run or we stop. And from mathematical point of view, but okay, not stochastic, but uh, for analysts, it's called a Stefan problems. So we find that divide the uh, state space, find the state space and divide it into two areas, continuation area and stopping area. And that kind of mathematics we find in the investigating as well such phenomena as melting ice. Yes, because we've got three things. One, this is mechanism of propagation of heat. Uh, within uh, a solid state, propagation of heat within a liquid and energy minimization uh, which links together this two mechanism and produces such beautiful pictures here. So we've got ice here and water here. And here we've got free boundary between ice and water. And so uh, I like this picture, especially today today's weather, uh, but there is one unpleasant thing here. The free boundary is unpleasant because uh, the cause of dimensionality consists not only of the fact that uh, you have to make more computations in larger dimensions, but we've got some strange and ugly topology of the free boundary. Yes, in dimension one, it's easy. On the left, you've got ice. On the right, you've got liquid. So the free boundary consists of one point or several points at most. Here, there is something uh, very unpleasant to describe. Uh, so, We've got a large number of uh, interest rate models. Some of them uh, are essentially work essentially in smaller dimensions. Some prefer larger dimensions. There are several reasons why to choose one or another. So that's not uh, something I, I would like to talk about today. Uh, I would like uh, rather 
to show you that very ugly situation that if you've got a larger dimensional model, it is a richer model. So it may be better fit to the market or have a nicer, uh, nicer uh, analytical properties. But on the other hand, we would like to reduce the dimension of the problem to dimension one at, at the, uh, in the best case, just because the curse of dimensionality. And all the Italians probably know where we are. You know where we are, Italians? For sure. Of course, this is Strato di Messina, uh, Strait of Messina, so between uh, Calabria and Sicilia. Uh, the city of uh, Scilla still exists. Uh, the Caribdis doesn't exist anymore, I'm afraid. So something has changed in there. But that's the situation, very ugly situation of the model, which, uh, which uh, tries to, has to choose between rich model and poor model and to survive one or another way. Uh, there are, of course, various uh, numerical techniques. So I think uh, you've had, you had a very good lecture yesterday by Karel about it. So that part of the talk may be skipped. Uh, maybe there is one trick or technique. So it's to some extent, it's mathematical. To some extent, it's not. Uh, it's called longstaff Schwartz method. It's uh, or American Monte Carlo. It's based on some properties on uh, of Hilbert space, so square integrable random variables. So if we've got a uh, square integrable random variables. The random variable, uh, okay, now maybe when we one step back before. So the essential part of the calculation of the uh, of the bar of Bermudan swaption value is the calculation of this expected value. So the propagation of the uh, of the value function. So when we are able to calculate that, that is given by as increasing value of the option and taking maximum of the function systems. So when we are able to calculate that, it's easy. Uh, but then of course, this calculation is, is the problem. And We've got a nice theorem, even don't know whose name is that, that in the Hilbert space, the orthogonal projection minimizes the difference. So if we take a family of functions of the Monte Carlo realizations at time Tn. The, the one which is closed, close to this, this value 
will be the conditional expected value. And of course, there is a practical problem which to which class of these functions to, to reduce. And that's practical. So there is no mathematics that secrets of the cuisine. Uh, and and lockstep Schwartz method gives us the possibility to cheat. So we might take it is essentially based on the Markovian property of the dynamics. but may be used for non-Markovian processes as well. So we may reduce the number of problems of the, pro uh, of the, uh, the di dimension of the problem to dimension one. This is mathematically not justified, but this is quite often done by, uh, by quants. And that's, uh, I would say, the most popular way of pricing collable products in larger dimensions. And I would like to suggest you the, another method, which is based on a result uh, of a former employee of the University of Barcelona with a very strange name. Who was that? Istvan Dzienc. So the one dimensional projection of the. Uh, so uh, Istvan considered that paper as a, an unimportant case study, but this is the most acknowledged result, result of him. So what is the idea of the one dimensional projection? Uh, we take dynamics of the swap rate. So we make some calculations, so using Kito, and trust me, the equation for the discounted risky asset and, disc and discounted risk that asset are like that. Then we do exactly what Bruno Dupier did. 30 years back. So to be honest, that was not uh, Bru uh, de Pierre, but Dervan Utkani some years later. So this is the mathematical derivation of the, uh, of the de Pierre formula. But here we work in the, for interest rates. So it was not done before. So we use here, the eta formula, and to, to be honest, not exactly eta formula, but eta tanaka, because that term is not quite differentiable. And here we get the Dirac delta. And but, okay, let's forget it. Make just calculations. We assume that everything is regular. So we make these calculations. And if you trust me, in the end, we get the following. Uh, integral partial differential equation with integral term, but it's not uh, integral differential equation because, uh, OK, you will see why on the next slide. Uh, and then when we differentiate twice this term, 
we got just Fokker flies, uh, Fokker plant equation for a Fokker plant equation. So we know from the uh, Markov potential theory that there is a relation one to one between Fokker plant equations and diffusions. So we take the diffusion drift and terms from here. And here we've got a one dimensional stochastic equation such that European option prices coincide with those of uh, complex European swaps, European, not Berlin. Okay, so when we've got such uh, one dimensional projections, we may just uh, we may just solve yeah here we may just solve the uh, the free bounder problems related to uh, to uh, Bermudan swaptions and Okay, compare results with other methods. So here is no mathematics, just uh, just numerical experiment. And to to what conclusion? Of course, I wouldn't uh, put that uh, picture into the presentation. We didn't. We didn't have a perfect coincidence uh, of all methods. Uh, why so? So that was because Markov property is difficult to quantify. The, in fact, when we've got a family of European of European uh, options, and we have to choose the best one of them. We don't know if the process dynamics describing all these prices is Markovian or not. And we don't have any tool, so at least I don't know, any tool to test uh, if it is Markovian or not. And if it is not Markovian, how far from the Markov property it is? So that's the problem. Quantitative uh, measures of the Markov property. And that's uh, an example. Now, not an example, that's an observation, practical, again, practical. So that was done by Lech Grzelak, Julek, and myself during the last year, that the, the difference between these two lines is the early exercise premium for American, American options. And the conclusion from this picture is that only a short rate and dividend rate count in the in practice, in practice for the price of American products. Difference between uh, price of uh, American options and European options. And when you talk to traders, they agree. So that's the so-called split knowledge. And uh, I think I've got still five minutes. So that's, uh, this is the good time to, to answer some questions if there are 
If there are any, so thank you for your attention. That is everything what I had to tell you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's no time for questions, comments. I have a naive question that I use because I'm not uh, familiar with the interest rate derivatives. In this uh, scenario, we usually work with uh, long maturities or long short maturities, mat both? Long mature. maturities are long. So comparing to uh, equities or FX, maturities are very long. So, so the benchmark option is 5-5. Five, five. So five year, mm -hmm. five years maturity of the option and five years for the swap, and that's five that's years. counted in years, not in okay. not in days but in years. Uh, the conclusion is that uh, hedging in interest rate market looks differently uh, because. Uh, we have to recalibrate the, the model so hatching policies break. So, the recalibration is monthly, weekly, or? Uh, it depends on the market, but I would say weekly would be would be reasonable. So but okay, let's say for security monthly. Okay. Thanks. So more questions, comments, you can write in the chat even if you want. I think there are no more questions or comments. So thank you very much, Darius. And uh, the next is Speaker, the next session starts at uh, 10, so we have a four minute break and we come back at 10. So, see you then. How to switch that off? Okay, I think it's it's my fault. I forgot to know. I think next speaker is Alessandro. Alessandro, are you here? Yes, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? So I'm going to make you some kind of co-host uh, and then you can try to see if you can share the slides. I may share my slides. Oh, okay. mm, so, mm, I, I don't know why, but no. Uh, I'm trying. I try no. Okay. Okay. No, I see everything super well, but the problem is that this is small. Okay, I try to adjust my... Yes, yeah, some kind of full screen because if not... Uh... So uh, the full screen is a smaller screen. Yeah, and I think uh, if you go to Vista... I, I, okay, I don't know why. Is this? No, but if you go to the top of your screen, you go to Vista and then full screen. Okay, just a moment. Okay, this is the... Uh, uh, uh. But no, I cannot... Uh, your screen is disa disappeared. Okay, okay, this is my... Yes. Okay. But I think you can go to Vista, so in the top. File, modifica, vista, and then uh, uh, modalita, okay. 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 I think my video is uh, saying hello to you. Okay, yeah, yes, hi.
Uh, Alessandro, you are from Tor Vergat, I think, not? Yes, 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 yes. I'm here, uh, so it's it's better to stay here instead of staying at home uh, when doing this kind of. of Why? Huh? Why? Oh, uh, this morning my daughter uh, has an ah. exam, is doing an exam, so. Uh, oh. Oh, I see. Yes. To come here, uh, but you know, I think we are getting used to these kind of situations. Hmm? We are getting uh, used. Uh, we are getting more familiar with these kind of situations. Oh, yes, uh, yes. In online I, sessions, so I, I, I was I afraid. Uh, I was afraid to that the uh, the internet connection connection. Oh yes. Uh, could uh, could be. Uh, no, not very stable to to manage uh, these two. Uh, yes, this is another problem. Connection. But sometimes it is unstable from the university. So yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> also, I have to say, Alessandro, that I am more quiet at home than in my office because uh, yesterday in my office I I was trying to follow the conference in the oh, morning and continuously having people oh, coming oh. in. <laughs> Oh. I, 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 I believe you, Mavira, because when I, the, every time I have been in your office, it is a oh. space where there is a lot of people coming inside. <laughs> yes, it is, yeah, this I, is very I, common in, in, in offices, in university, but in Mavira's office, this happens. Oh, no, uh, luckily enough, uh, in this period here, I, I am on the third floor of the building. And so in this period, uh, it's... So welcome everybody to the, uh, this new talk uh, by Professor Alessandro Ramponi from uh, Universitat Tor, Tor Bergata, who is going to... Uh, uh, explain us about approximatics VA for European claims. So thank you very much, Alessandro, for being here. Okay, the floor no, is on no. yours. And thank you for the organization of the workshop, of this very nice workshop. Uh, so I, um, I, I'll speak about uh, the, uh, some approximate evaluation of the so-called uh, XVA, uh, so the valuation adjustments for European claims, so which is the uh, a joint work with Fabio Antonelli and Sergio uh, Scarlatti. Uh, so the problem that we consider is a problem of evaluation of the evaluation of a European claim uh, between two parties. Uh, we consider an uh, over-the-counter uh, over-the-counter. Uh, product. Uh, the two parties are the investor and the counterparty. And uh, the European claim is defined by a given payoff f, which is which is given. So uh, we it's well known from classical theory that the uh, value of this European claim is given by the conditional, the discounted conditional expectation of the payoff uh, under a, a risk neutral measure. But uh, in the last decades, it emerged the need of considering uh, other sources of risk, uh, which, uh, may, uh, which may, which influence the price uh, of the deal. This kind of sources of risk are included in the, the valuation evaluation procedure in the form of adjustment of the uh, risk neutral price of the claim. And uh, uh, the sorts of risk that we want to account uh, for uh, in, uh, in this evaluation exercise uh, are mainly due to the possibility of the fault of the counterparty. And this part of the adjustment is called the CVA and DVA, uh, but also there are other sorts of risks uh, which are given by the uh, funding investment strategies or uh, problem with uh, well, risks due to liquidity, um, to liquidity and also to capital valuation adjustment, margin valuation adjustment, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
This kind of adjustment uh, are, uh, take the uh, acronym are set in, uh, um, in the acronym of uh, which is uh, EXBA, which is uh, called the XBA, where X stands for C, D, F, L, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the literature on this kind of problem is, uh, is uh, really growing in the last years, and here I, uh, I, I signed all, uh, I, I wrote uh, uh, some books uh, which are very, uh, uh, very important books on, on, on the topic. Uh, so, um, well, what's the, um, uh, the Uh, the topic uh, of this talk. Uh, I will talk about the valuation adjustment and how it can be uh, phased into a so-called intensity-based model, and uh, I'll explain in a moment uh, what does it mean. And uh, the interesting problem that uh, uh, it comes out, uh, it comes out is that this kind of uh, framework uh, leads uh, to uh, very uh, in a very nice way to a mathematical structure uh, a mathematical representation of the uh, this valuation of the value of the claim uh, through the uh, backward stochastic differential equation representation uh, then uh, i'll specify a little the market uh, the, the, the market uh, in which we do some calculation by considering a black and shore, uh, a simple black and shore market, but with the intensity, well, with the correlation structure with the default event, default event uh, of the, uh, the investor of the possible default event uh, of the investor or the counterparty. And this correlation structure is a model, it's a way of model uh, of uh, uh, considering the so-called wrong, uh, wrong or right way risk for the uh, for the claim. Uh, then I'll present uh, the our result, which is the fir first order approximation for the solution of this uh, backwards stochastic differential equation. It's some numerical result. So uh, this is based. This presentation is based on. Uh, a, a paper uh, by myself and Fabio and Sergio, um, uh, which has been submitted this year. Uh, so, uh, just to be uh, a little more uh, uh, precise, we consider. Uh, I, I would like to introduce now the general valuation problem. Uh, and uh, how this problem is translated into a backward stochastic differential equation. So we consider a market which is described by a uh, given probability space with the market filtration F, described by an interest rate with, which we consider deterministic interest rate and the uh, corresponding uh, money market account, and then uh, the log price uh, uh, of the underlying uh, the, uh, the option, uh, which is called X. Uh, we consider, uh, we assume in particular that uh, um, uh, we are in a, a absence of arbitrage uh, framework and that we have a risk neutral measure, which is given. Uh, then we have to describe the uh, default event. Uh, so uh, we consider two in a, we, we consider this in an intensity approach. So the default event of the counterparty of the investor are uh, modeled as some random times to one and to two, which are not stopping times with respect to the market filter, filtration. So. Uh, as usual in this kind of approach, uh, the market filtration has to be must be enlarged by considering the sigma algebras uh, generated by the default uh, event. Uh, the main tool in this kind of framework is the key lab, but, but this is quite standard, uh, quite quite standard. 
Um, in this framework, uh, we may consider, uh, we, we, uh, we may model the uh, conditional probability of default uh, in the form of uh, uh, by means of some uh, positive processes, which are called the intensities of default. Um, and uh, we assume, uh, as a classical framework, that these two defaults are conditionally independent. Uh, some uh, refinement may be done uh, in this context, but they are quite technical in a sense. Um, the conditional independence of the two default times um, uh, makes us able to write the intensity, uh, the intensity of the uh, first default time uh, of one of the two parties of the contract. So uh, the, the sum of the two intensity processes is the intensity process of the uh, first default time in, in this framework. Uh, so we uh, we can describe um, more uh, uh, in particular the uh, the payoff uh, for the uh, for this kind of uh, in, in this framework. So the idea is that uh, we assume uh, that to to describe the the way in which this deal is uh, traded between the two parties that this claim pays no dividends well these are uh, well, this may be uh, 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 this is just to make the formula not, not too complex uh, but uh, the, uh, the other uh, assumption that we made is that the adjustment processes so all the adjustment that we introduce uh, for describing the payoff of the deal depends uh, on the, uh, a given uh, process, which is called the close-out value of the process that we consider adapted to the market filtration. In words, uh, uh, the close-out value of the process, the close-out value of, of the deal is the residual value of the deal at time, uh, at time, at time S. Hence, we consider a collateralization process, um, which is given by a percentage of this close-out value uh, and is uh, adapted to the market filtration. So we uh, consider that uh, the, uh, the derivative is collateralized. So there is a collateral account in which the investor and Counterparty uh, put some money uh, to uh, to collateralize the uh, day trade, and uh, we assume that this collateral account uh, has this form. So, so it's a percentage of the value of the closeout value of the deal. So uh, C. S is the collateral account is positive if the investor is a collateral uh, taker. Uh, otherwise, uh, if the investor is a collateral provider, is negative. Alpha is a quantity fixed and deterministic, maybe even a constant. Then at time S, the exposure for the investor, uh, the net exposure for the investor is the value of the close-out value of the trade minus the collateral account, the, the value of the collateral, and with, with, with the positive part, uh, and the converse for the counterparty. Uh, this collateral account, uh, this collateral account uh, generates wealth with a given rate, which is RC, the uh, collateral rate. Um, so we consider even the uh, recovery uh, recovery percentage in case of default, uh, which are uh, related to the loss given default L. And then we consider also 
the investing strategies and the edging strategies to describe, to completely describe uh, the, uh, the, the trade between, between the two parties. So the parties may invest in a riskless asset with a rate or fee, and this is the funding rate, uh, and uh, in the risky asset, and we uh, consider by, uh, as done in uh, uh, several papers by, uh, especially by Brigo and Pallavicini, uh, that uh, this, uh, the, the trade on the risky asset happens in a repurchasement market, with, uh, which is characterized by a given rate, which is H, the repo rate, uh, the repo rate. Uh, so phi is the quantity invested in the riskless asset, H is the edge of the trade. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, the quantities that enter in the description, in the, the detailed description of the trade between the two parties for the European claim. So uh, we may introduce the cash flow of this trade by considering all these parts. So uh, we have uh, the cash flow uh, produced by uh, this trade are described by the payment due to the contract, which is the uh, standard um, uh, definition of the payoff of the contract, the uh, risk-free uh, uh, payoff of the contract, uh, multiplied by the uh, uh, indicator of the default event. Uh, then we have to consider the payments to, due to the default of one of the counterparty, which are the discounted value of a given function that I'll specify uh, in a moment. Then we have to consider the payment, the streams of payments due to the collateral account, which takes this form. Uh, so we, uh, we take the point of view of uh, a continuous time, uh, continuous time processes. So uh, the stream uh, related to the collateral account are given by this quantity. Uh, well, essentially, C is the value of the collateral account. It grows with the risk free rate R, but I have to pay the, uh, well, I have to pay or to have the um, uh, collateral rate according to the sign, of course, of C. C is positive, is the, uh, if the investor is a collateral taker, and, uh, and so I have to pay the uh, collateral rate. Uh, C is negative, uh, so the investor is a collateral uh, provider, and so this is negative, I, I, I get uh, the uh, collateral rate. Um, then, in the same way, uh, these are the streams, uh, the flows uh, related to the funding strategies and to the edging uh, strategies. Moreover, we uh, consider as a condition that the value of the claim uh, is uh, replicated completely by the funding strategy, by the edging strategies, and by the uh, collateral account. Uh, so by putting all together, we have the description, the detailed description of the cash flow of the trade, uh, which is simply the sum of all this part. So this is the and uh, it is discounted and uh, we, then we take the conditional expectation, uh, conditional uh, with respect to the G filtration of all the uh, of all the cash flow just described. So we have this part is the contractor cash flow. This is the definition of the on default cash flow, which takes into account the default events, to one and to two, L1 and L2 are the loss given default. 
uh, and epsilon is the close out value, so the value of the deal at the time of the fold. Uh, then we have the cost uh, due to the funding strategy. This uh, and these last two are the cost due to collateralization and edging. Um, all these terms are the uh, adjustment of the uh, risk neutral price of the uh, of the trade. Uh, this is the CVA and DVA. This is the funding value adjustment, and the last two are related to the liquidity value adjustment. Uh, we mm, the, there are there is the uh, possibility of having some slightly different definition according to some other. Uh, given in some other approaches but uh, this is uh, what we uh, what we consider um, so by putting all together we uh, we finally get in this valuation equation uh, which is the conditional expectation uh, under the uh, conditional expectation with respect to the uh, filtration to the enlarged filtration of all this now, uh, we, as usual in the intensity based model, we want to, um, to write this conditional expectation with respect to the market filtration. And then we use the intensity based approach uh, to translate uh, the uh, default event uh, defined in terms of the default time into the uh, conditional probability of the fault, uh, conditional with respect to the market filtration. So we switch to the F filtration by applying the key lemma, we project the, the, the expectation with respect to the uh, uh, larger filtration on into the uh, um, market filtration, and we finally get uh, to this kind of uh, uh, valuation equation. Um, so CA is the adjusted price of the European claim uh, defined as the uh, solution of this equation. Since CA appears in both sides of the equality and in terms of the uh, market observable uh, quantities. So lambda is the intensity uh, of the default time, and uh, CA is the quantity that we want to, uh, to evaluate, and epsilon is the uh, close-out value of the, uh, of the deal. Uh, so this is a form of backward stochastic differential equation uh, stated in the F uh, filtration. We use this form of BSD instead of the uh, more standard differential notation. Uh, we prefer to do this. Um, so um, we have to work a bit. Uh, a bit more on this uh, valuation equation. Uh, and so in order to do this, uh, in order to discuss uh, a little the uh, structure of this backward stochastic differential equation, we have to specify uh, the dynamic of the, of the, of the quantity. So we, uh, we consider a simple, very simple uh, local volatility model. Um, with the condition that the, the volatility function is bounded, well, it's bounded by uh, this linear function of the underlying, uh, and that the intensities are uh, diffusion processes, and uh, um, the uh, the three uh, so the, the three processes are correlated. Uh, with a given structure, so lambda i are dependent, uh, and uh, uh, s depends on uh, lambda one and lambda two. Um, so, okay, and this is the uh, the first. Uh, in, in in particular, we consider then we consider when we uh, uh, do some. 
I'll present some calculation, we consider a, a constant um, volatility, so the standard black and short market, and the Cox Singelson gross models for the intensity of the fault. Um, so, um, we have to work a little on the uh, backward stochastic differential equation. Um, and the idea, the main idea is that the solution, we write this in an integral form, the solution of the backward stochastic differential equation uh, is related, uh, one part of the solution of the backward stochastic differential equation, according to the Martin Miller presentation theorem, uh, under this market, uh, so assuming the Markovianity of the price of the deal, uh, it may be proven that the component of the BSD, uh, the backward stochastic differential equation, uh, uh, has this form. And so, uh, if we specify as the edging strategy, uh, the delta edging strategy, we simply have that the, uh, the component H, the process H, may be written as, uh, uh, as a linear function of Z. Uh, so, uh, we may change measure in such a way to include the edging term into a new Brownian motion. And so, uh, so we include this term, which is proportional to Z, according to the uh, assumption that uh, we are using the delta edging strategy. And so we may absorb this term in a new Brownian motion by using the Gibson of theorem. Uh, in such a way, the new, uh, under the new measure, we get uh, finally a forward backward stochastic differential equation, which is given by in this form. So the new dynamic for the underlying is given by this one, in which the drift is uh, related, is no more given by the risk free rate by but uh, it is given by the edging rate. And then the equation, the backward stochastic differential equation, takes this form. Uh, so up to now, the only thing that we have to, uh, to choose is the value of the uh, closeout uh, term, so of the value of epsilon. Now we have two possible choices. Uh, which are uh, both are considering the ISTA, ISTA master agreement. Uh, the first one uh, is the uh, is the choice that we uh, we did uh, is the uh, risk free close out value. So we take uh, as the, uh, the the close out value the default free value of the claim. Uh, the other, in this case, we get uh, a linear BSD. That's the reason of this choice, uh, a linear BSD. Uh, if we take, as done, for example, in the paper by Brigo and Pallavicini, the replacement close-out value, so the, uh, the close-out value is given by the value of the deal itself, then we get with a non-linear BSD. Uh, this is due to the positive and negative part of uh, which enter in the definition of the uh, of the a a equation. So in that case, uh, we have to resort to numerical procedures like Monte Carlo schemes for BSD or the solution of the uh, corresponding semilinear PDE, which is related to the. Uh, under some assumption on the regularity of the coefficient, uh, uh, we may uh, have we may uh, write the semilinear PD um, for the price. Or uh, in the last year, uh, some um, procedure related to the use of neural network or deep learning algorithms for the solution of this kind of. Uh, uh, backwards stochastic differential equation. Uh, 
uh, we use uh, instead the, uh, the uh, default free value of the claim, so the risk-free close-out assumption, in order to have uh, a, a representation of the solution in terms of conditional expectation. Um, this is uh, possible uh, according to the ISTA master uh, agreement. Um, then, uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this assumption, we end up with a, a linear BSD which may be solved and having this and in the form uh, which I explained here. So, it's uh, the risk, uh, the, the payoff. Uh, uh, the discounted payoff, uh, discounted uh, with uh, some rate and the intensities, uh, plus a term um, which does not depend on the solution. So this is the general solution of a linear BS, BSD with the term C given by this, uh, this function. Uh, now we may specify a little, uh, a little uh, our processes and we fix uh, um, Black and Schultz market and the Cox Ingelson Ross uh, Cox Ingelson Ross in models for the intensities. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Alessandro, but uh, we have five minutes left. Okay, okay. I'll I'll uh, present our result now. And okay. uh, so with some other. Uh, simplifying hypothesis, so we take all the rates as deterministic, as fixed deterministic, and also the, um, um, the loss given default, uh, uh, given person, given values, given person to the values, we end up with, uh, 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 with this kind of expectation. Uh, so, um, our procedure is, consists in uh, trying to uh, approximate the value, this, this expectation, uh, um, since uh, this term cannot uh, be computed in closed form. They depend on the uh, log gas price and on the intensity. So we have expectation depending on all the sources of risk of the randomness of the, of the system. So lambda, the intensity, and the log uh, prices. Even in this function, uh, psi, uh, we have the product of the intensity and the uh, underlying uh, through the function C, which is the black and short function. So the idea is to use, in order to compute this expectation, we use a two-step procedure, consists, which consists on a conditioning procedure, uh, which uh, makes us able to uh, express the expectation to, uh, to use uh, as much as possible the um, uh, closet form uh, solution, closet form formulas, uh, and a change of numerator for um, using uh, again uh, the form of uh, the affine uh, properties for the uh, Cox Ingelson Ross uh, models. So in, in such a way, uh, the probability of defaults, so the quantities related to the, uh, to the intensity process, uh, takes the form of. Uh, bond, uh, the expression of uh, a bond in the uh, Cox Ingelson Ross model. Um, so we are able to do some calculation and uh, so uh, we uh, consider a first order approximation in which uh, um, the expansion of the solution of expansion of the solution of the BSD uh, is uh, uh, taken uh, according, uh, with respect to the correlation parameters. So we are able to compute the, uh, the derivative of the solution with respect to the correlation parameter. Um, we 
see that uh, uh, the, expre the conditioning, uh, conditioning procedure uh, makes us able to write the, uh, the, the value of the deal as the expectation of the Black and Schultz pricing function computed in uh, some processes which depends on rho. And so we are able to do the derivative of the Black and Schultz function with respect to the correlation parameter. These are related, of course, uh, on the delta of the uh, pricing function CBS and on the vega. By doing this derivative, we arrive uh, at the computation of quantities like this one, which are the uh, expectations related to the intensity processes. In order to uh, face this problem, we use a change of numerator to uh, in order to uh, be able to compute uh, this, uh, to simplify the computation of this quantity. And hence, uh, we end up with a representation, with the first order approximation of the price of this, uh, of this deal uh, of this form. Well, this, well, this is the, first, the, the zero order term, so the term in rho equal to zero, uh, which takes this form. It seems complicated, but it's just uh, uh, in, in a time integral of all uh, very simple functions. The expectation of lambda, the expectation uh, that must be computed uh, under the new measure according to the change of numerator, so they must be approximated. And then we have also expression for G1 and G2, which are slightly more complex and involve the integral of other kind of expectation. Um, so the results of this first order approximation are compared to a Monte Carlo uh, computation, Monte Carlo approximation of this quantity, which is the uh, solution of the PSD. Uh, with our assumption, and we get uh, uh, very interesting results uh, um, that can be shown here. We, here at the table for this is the error between uh, the first order approximation and the Monte Carlo uh, price, uh, which are reported here in a graphical form. So I I finish my presentation and uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Alessandro. Now it's time for questions, comments. So, one question, Alessandro all these uh, uh, XBA adjustments are uh, uh, very dependent on the underlying model we calibrate or? Uh, yes, yes, they are dependent on the model for the underlying. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, what I'm trying to uh, to do is to uh, my my idea is to try to um, uh, to use also uh, stochastic volatility models, uh, but the situation is. Um, more difficult in uh, dealing with the uh, solution of the backward stochastic differential equation in this context. So it's, it's more uh, it's more difficult than in this uh, local volatility model to deal with the solution of the backward stochastic differential equation. But that's okay. the idea to for going into the future. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, more questions or comments? So, I think now we can uh, go with the next talk. Um, I don't know if it's Raul is here. We can try to. Hello. To, uh, I Raul, I'm going to allow you to uh, share the screen. Let's wait a moment because I have to look for you in the list. I think you can share the screen, Raul. I'm going to try to share the screen. Just a second. Now let me share it. Okay. 
and here I have it. Okay. Okay, uh, Raúl. So, okay. So we are we are basically ten minutes. Uh, we have a ten minutes delay, so we are going to finish with ten minutes delay. Well, I will try to be a little bit brief. With no, don't worry. Don't worry. So okay. I'm, Hello. I'm going to present you, Raúl. So okay. the next talk is going to, to be by Raúl Merino from Vida Caixa. And it's going to be about high cover approximations to call option prices in the Heston model. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Raúl, for being here today. So you, the floor is uh, okay. on yours when you want. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for assisting to the conference. Today I'm going to talk to an approximation of the Heston model. This, appro this approximation is, a paper, is based on a paper with Archie Gulishashvili, with Giuseppe Vives, and also with Marla Unas, and is based on the decomposition formula of, of Elisa Loss. Okay, just a brief introduction that most of us we already know. Okay, the first model that we know for valuing European call options is, is due to Louis Bachelier in his thesis theory of the speculation. Okay, and the first model that we have and we still use on on, on finance is the Black Scholes Merton model that was published in 1973. Okay, this is the cornerstone of modern uh, financial mathematics, and it's a formula that is still using today to, to quote prices, for example. So for us, it's going to be one of the principal terms that we want to express things when we want to 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 make a, a new formula for the Heston approximation. Okay, that will be our base model. Okay, here is just the, the Black Scholes Merton formula, as we already know. Then we will make a little change in this formula. For our purposes, we will need to rearrange a little bit the terms of the formula to make it uh, a different expression of that. It's just a convenience matter of choosing the, the variables. Okay, so in this formula, the dynamics are given by the following SDE, okay, with the particularity that the volatility is constant. That is one of the main uh, drawbacks of this model, okay. Uh, the volatility that we use in the Black Scholes Merton formula to match market prices is called in plate volatility. And normally, when we see quotes on the market, the quotes are based on the implied volatility. We can see prices, and sometimes we can see implied volatility is quotes, okay? But uh, something that happened is in, 80, uh, in 1987, okay, there was the Black Friday, one of the biggest financial crises occurred. So in that moment, the presence of the volatility smile was uh, looked by, by practitioners and then they tried to model it. Okay, there were other models that were able to show some type of a skew, like the Merton model or the CEV model, but none of them can explain the volatility smile, like for example, in the FX. So one of the first approaches to try to improve that uh, this smile was due to Heston, and Heston is a type of stochastic volatility model. We, we keep the same stochastic volatility equation for the stock price, but we make a little change that, that the volatility now is not constant. The volatility now depends on another stochastic differential equation. Okay, this model is very popular. And why is very popular? Because even it's a little bit more complex to, to price uh, derivatives with them. And uh, we have semi-closed formulas to price calls and put options. And there are several methods to try to do it a little bit faster. And today we're going to present a different method that maybe is not that well known as fast for transformations or other types of methods, okay? So we're going to base on, on this popular model, the rest of the talk. Uh, the, the composition formula that is the, the approximation that we are going to use can be utilized to expand at different types of models, but this is something we are not going to talk today. 
one of the first things that we need to do is just formatting of convenience uh, things to work without making this change is rearrange a little bit the black Scholes merton formula and we're going to express uh, respect to the log spot and the variance it's just because the calculations are a little bit uh, easier when it depends on the log spot and the variance you can do it with with the spot prices as well but the variance is, is very convenient because it helps a lot to simplify formulas. Okay, we're going to refer with them with the white hat. Okay. Okay, the composition formula. The composition formula is an idea of Elisa Loss. Okay, we're going to explain a little bit with what's the idea. The first thing that we're going to do is set a starting model to, to do the composition because the decomposition formula depends on the model. So we are going to consider a very general price dynamics. That is the, the question number one, okay, where R is the interest rate, rho is the correlation, and the volatility process is going to grab a process added to the filtration double B. Of course, if we have this type of model, without losing any type of unity, we can rewrite it using the log price, which in this case is going to be useful to make calculus a little bit simple. Okay, it has their door box, but in general, one of the good things is that when we work with the log prices, the derivatives are a little bit easier to calculate. So some preliminaries before starting with the composition, we're going to assume that the time is the time to maturity, well, the, the expiration time is bigger than zero, and the strike and interest rates are fixed. We consider a payoff ATXI that belongs to the space C122. Okay, it's also assumed that the derivatives are continuous. Uh, with intention ET as the expectation with respect to the natural filtration and the prices given by, by the usual terms to price a call option. Okay. We do that because we want to generalize a little bit of the composition for not any kind of payoff, but almost uh, any kind of European payoff. Okay. So we're going to define the following operators. This is just for simplifying a little bit the notation because we'll depend a lot on the derivatives of the Black Scholes Merton to do the approximation. And this is just a, a nice way to express things. And we're going to define the following continuous same martingales that has the same purpose that is trying to simplify a little bit the decomposition, okay, in just uh, some specific terms because everything will be dependent on L and D. Uh, that are just conditional expectations that in the case of the Heston model, we're able to calculate explicitly. So it, it's quite nice in the Heston model. Okay, and now we are going to go with the idea of the decomposition formula. The idea of the decomposition formula is that we want to express uh, the collection as a sum of Black Scholes Merton plus other terms. Uh, in this case, we know that the price uh, of an option can be described by the, the, again, the, expect, the conditional expectation of Black Scholes using uh, the average future variance. Um, um, in this case, uh, one of the first approach was to use uh, Malvin calculus. This is quite natural because uh, um, the average future variance is, is anticipative. Okay, so uh, it's very natural to use Malvin calculus. But one of the main ideas of Alisa in a paper of 2012 was that I can use, instead of that, I can use the, the adapted projection of the average future variance, which simplify things because one of the good things doing this little change is that we are able to use the classical ITO, ITO the composition formula, ITO formula. So we're switching an anticipative problem to an anticipative one, which simplifies a lot the calculations. Um, or at least you can do it without the use of modeling calculus, that it's a little bit easier if you don't know modeling calculus. We need to define the Martingale M. It's just a matter of convenience as well. And we can rewrite the adaptive projection of the following way. And if we derive, we obtain the following formula that is going to help us on the decomposition formula. 
So basically the decomposition formula is the following one. We're going to consider the, the log price process just as a matter of convenience. And we're going to define a BT, that is a continuous semi-martingale respect to filtration. Um, later on, we'll see why we need BT. Okay, now it's going to be a little bit pointless, but later we'll see that it will help us to, to generalize a little bit the, the way to decompose and approximate the formula. So then for any almost any type of payoff, we can approximate the payoff by the following uh, formula, which is a little bit large and can be get as a little bit of freight at the beginning, but then things get much more simpler. Okay, this is a very generic formula. It has a lot of terms. It can be a little bit confusing, but we can improve that. Okay, it's just the first step. Okay, we are just preparing uh, preparing the meal. Okay, so of course we can go. Uh, we can prove this theorem in a very very easy way. To do it, uh, we need to, to be aware of the Feynman gap process associated to, to the equation. In this case, is the following uh, Feynman gap process. And uh, applying the ETO formula to this process and uh, making use of uh, this, of the Feynman gap formula, this equality of the Feynman gap formula, we can prove very easily the, the, the theorem. It's not very hard to, to prove. If we see, if you see the paper or my thesis, you can see the proof that they led. But basically, the two elements to make the proof is apply the ETO formula to this process, and then uh, make use of this idea to simplify some terms. Okay. Now we're going to add some some conditions to the formula. We're going to suppose that the payoff satisfy the following equation, okay? And if that is satisfied, we can simplify a little bit the formula for the following one, okay? We also have been simplified the notation of A and B to, little, to make it a little bit more easier to understand, okay? Which is a little bit more nicer than the other one. At least it has less terms, so we feel a little bit more comfortable with something that is a little bit tinier. Okay, and now we're going to play a little bit with the Black Scholes formula. Okay, if we assume that CSV is a co option formula under a stochastic volatility model, we know that at the, at the time to maturity, uh, the payoff of the European one with the stochastic volatility and, and the stochastic volatility model is going to be the same. So that means that at initial time, the price on little t is the same that the conditional expected expectation of the formula, of the collapsion formula discounted, okay? And now what we're going to do is to choose a proper A and B. In this case, A is going to be the plug source formula that of course is going to satisfy this one, especially with the log uh, spot price, okay? Satisfies this equation. So if we choose this upper pit A and B, what we're going to find is the following decomposition formula is that the, the price of a collapsion in a stochastic volatility model can be decomposed by the classical Black Scholes formula plus two terms that explains the stochastic volatility. Okay, that's the point. Uh, we have found a decomposition, but there is a little bit drawback here. It's a, a very nice and compact formula, but one of the problems that we have here is that it's quite hard to compute, okay? If I want to use it to price of the derivative, I need to calculate this conditional expectation, and this is not really easier, okay? So then there is, there is a way to make things a little bit easier, but it has a cost because that we are making an error. Okay, an error that we can quantify. This was also part of an idea of Alos and Joseph Bibes uh, in a paper of 2015. The idea is that these terms of here, we are going to freeze them and we are going to put it at the beginning. We're going to take this outside the expectation. Of course, when we're doing that, we are not evaluating this expectation, we're evaluating something else 
that we expect to be closer enough to this price, okay, to this to these conditional expectations. So we're going to make a little error. Okay, so the idea is that we take this object expectation and we get this. Note that this is L and D that we introduce at the beginning. The good thing is that we know how to calculate this expectation and we know how to calculate this expectation. And with a little bit of luck, we will be we will know how to calculate this error. Okay, but now know that everything is things that we know how to calculate. We know how to calculate the Black Scholes equation. We know how to calculate the derivatives. It doesn't matter if it's respect the log spot, respect the variance, it's just a, a change of a variable. So we know how to do things. And we, of course, know how to calculate these expectation conditions. So we change from a formula that it was very hard to evaluate to someone that we can do things here and we can do things in a fast way, okay? So when we do that, uh, basically we need to calculate which are the terms in the box. Note as well that we are not working with a specific model. The only thing that we impose is that we are working with, with something with a log spot structure. This can be any stochastic volatility model. Depending on the stochastic volatility model, this expectation can, we will be able to calculate analytically or not, or will be easier or more difficult, but it will depend on the stochastic volatility model. In this, this formula is quite general. And we need to estimate which is the error, okay? Because maybe the error is, is huge depending on the model. We need to see that, okay? So, okay, we have a general approximation that is quite this in general. And now the question is, which is the error? And the error is something that we are going to be a little bit scared of because the error is all these little formulas, okay? All these conditional expectations. So there are a lot of them, which is a little bit scary at the beginning, okay? So we need to bond on these terms, basically. That's the point. Okay, uh, let's go into summarize a little bit ideas about the approximation. Uh, one thing that we don't say, but it's something that we can derive from, from this idea of here, this idea of here, we're saying that we can take this out, how we can take this, how we can find this formula, sorry, how we can find this, is just by applying in a recursive way this corollary. So we apply this corollary to seeing A and B in a right way that we are going to chase that this part of here is going to be A and the rest is going to be B. And choosing in the right way, which is A and B, we can apply to this ex conditional expectation as well. And we can choose this as A and the other as B. Choosing that we are able to apply in a recursive way, uh, the corollary being able to treat all of these, uh, all of these conditional expectations. That's the idea. So if we apply the correct two to each uh, term of the approximation, we can we are able to improve the the approximation formula because we are going to freeze this derivative, and then we are going to have uh, more terms, but we are going to be a little bit more accurate because we are going. For example, I can take this, I can freeze this and put it here. I can freeze this and put it here. I can do it for each one of them. And when I do that, I'm going to make uh, an error because I'm approximation this conditional expectation, but the order of magnitude will be better. Okay, that's the that's idea. Uh, apply the correct two is equivalent to freeze the derivative. Uh, it is not possible to calculate without specifying the volatility structure. We can make something generic. But if we want to calculate which is the error where we are making, we need to specify the volatility structure. If we need to calculate the, the, the conditional expectations, we need to specify the volatility structure. We can obtain a similar approximation to respect to the price instead of the log price. It is just changing variables. And we can do it recursively to each new terms that appears to improve the approximation, okay? So if we review the literature in the paper of a loss 2015 with Joseph, um, 
they already calculate, which is the error term, which is the order of error of the first approximation. And the error was uh, nu square rho plus uh, nu square, okay? In fact, it was quite good. And in our paper, what we do is we try to improve the accuracy of this formula, is what we try to do. Okay, why we try to do it? Because the previous approximation, some terms of order nu square were ignored, and other terms were keep. So this can be like a little bit inconsistent. Why we are doing an approximation of some terms of the same magnitude and not others? So the idea is we're going to try to improve the approximation and take into account the same order terms, okay? Also, the other idea is what happens if I keep uh, doing approximations, I'm going to improve how much, okay? Uh, the idea is to apply the correct two to the terms of the same order. We will expand the decomposition formula without imposing which terms we develop and improving the precision of the approximation, okay? This is what we're going to do and what we want to see. So basically doing that, we're going to find a new approximation. This one will have all the terms uh, nu square. Uh, we'll have some other terms as well. One interesting thing is that this term and this term seems like a, a, a kind of eat of the composition. We'll talk later about that. Okay, we have this term that we already have it, and we have this new term, okay, that appears. So in this new approximation, we change the error of magnitude from uh, nu square to nu power three. So the approximation is a little bit better in order of magnitude. And we can go a little bit farther and do the following approximation. This is a little bit quite large and not like a, a, a curious thing that we have these two terms that we have in the previous one that we make the, the reference to Ito. But also an interesting thing is, it's going to see, I have this term and if I continue the composing, I will find something like gamma power four and this term power two. That is again, a type of, of Ito decomposition, I, a type of Taylor decomposition. The problem is that we're in a stochastic environment so instead of having a Taylor decomposition, we have something similar to stochastic Taylor decomposition. So more terms arise because everything talks to, to each other, like these terms, okay? And appears a lot of, of terms. If we see a paper about Catherall, they are explaining this about using, using trees and diamonds, okay? The good thing about this approximation is that this new power four. So we are finding different decompositions with different accuracies. Each term is bigger than the other. And also this formula is quite large. It's very easy to compute because we know everything on an analytical way. So as we can compute everything analytical, everything is quite easy and fast to calculate. Okay, let's go to see then. Okay, there is another one that we're going to see what happens when rho is equivalent to zero, just for simplify a little bit, the calculus, because we have seen that a lot of terms are appearing here. And here we can see that we have like the Ito de Taylor decomposition of this term, okay? And appears also this term of here, is because we're in a stochastic framework, okay? Things are not so similar. When rho is equivalent to zero, we can have an error of nu power six, that is quite good. Okay, this is very relevant because sometimes we have very high news. Okay, so let's go into see the numerical performance. Okay, we're going to see which is the precision of the formula and which is the, the computational time. Okay, and we're going to compare the precision of the formula against uh, um, a numerical integration. Okay. A semi-closed solution when numerical integration has has to be performed. Okay, this numerical integration has errors around ten power minus ten. Okay, so it, it's quite accurate. 
Um, the blue line illustrates the approximations of the of the first approximation formula of least and loss. The red line is the the new power three, and the yellow line is the new power four approximation. Okay. Something we can see is that in general the approximations, the new approximations, behave better than the others. Something that is quite interesting is that there are some ranges that the first approximation behaves better than the other. It is something that I was not able to understand why the error is behaving in, in this way. Uh, maybe it's something that we can study, but I think it's, it's a little bit hard to study specifically which is the, the form of the error. In this case, nu is, is little and rho is little. Let's go in to see what happens when we increase rho. What we see is that the approximations uh, get better, especially that the four approximation is much better than the others. In the other was a little bit more closer to each, each approximation. In this one, the difference are, are quite considerable. So the four approximation is behaving better than the first approximation of ELISA. And we're going to see what happens with when rho is little and rho vol is high. In this one, we see that the approximations in the short term behave in a similar way. And most on, on the different tau's time to maturity is behaving quite similar. It seems that the approximation is not dealing good with, with very high uh, ball balls, okay? Uh, let's go into see when we combine both of them. We can see that the approximation improves a little bit compared to, to the other one. Yes, because it was better performance when, when the correlation was high, okay? So when the correlation was high, the formulas improve a little bit, but there is not a huge difference between each and other. This is what, what we is going to impose to the, the, the row zero case, because we need to expand even more terms to see if we can improve the, the high volts approximation, okay? Let's go into see the correct case. The blue line is the new power four, that is the original formula by Elisa. And the red line is our new approximation, this new power six. And we're going to see that for uh, low volvos is going to improve a, a lot better. It also performs in a zone that it's difficult to know the quality because we know that the integration, that the semi closure formula was an error, an accuracy of 10 elevated minus 10. So this goes beyond that, which is quite good but it's an uncertain term of, of errors when we do the comparison, but it behaves much better. That is clear. Let's go into see when we price the Volvo, we see that we are already doing better, much better than in the other case. If we see the other case, we see that when the, the Volvo was high, the improvement was little, but here when the Volvo is, is high, the improvement is quite considerable. That make us think that instead of developing all the terms, maybe an, a different approach can be uh, develop the terms that are painful for you. So maybe you can arrange these terms and then it's easier to, to keep putting the, the Taylor formula for the, for the Volvo. You really know that you will have this term, you will know this term, you will know which is the following one. The only problem is find these ones that you need to work a little bit more for doing. But if you want to go in very quickly, you can approximate the, the Taylor series for this one, and I'm sure that you are going to win something. So you can pick which terms are the most painful for you in the approximation. Okay, let's going to see what about the time. If we do the heston lewis approximation, that is the, the base model that we do to, to, to do the test and see the accuracies, we see that, that it takes a lot of time, okay? This is different batch options. I think that this was 100 options, 1,000 options, 10,000 options. We can see that the, the uh, approximation method of ELISA is 45 times faster. And the second, the new approximation that we find is 45, 43 times faster. So adding two terms, it doesn't change much. Adding uh, all these terms that are a bunch of them, we're going to have 
a very similar accuracy is going to have 36 times 38 times faster okay it's a little bit more expensive than these ones because it has very very few elements but this one is in time is not that far we're speaking about 7.7 7 seconds i get 8.8 eight seconds so practically is is one second a little bit more expensive but the accuracy is, is much better okay now we're going to compare the approximation with with different uh, approximations on the literature one of Loric and another one of Forte uh, I'm going to go a little bit quickly here because we are running out of time um, our approximation would be the blue line okay uh, Loric will be red for the third approximation, yellow for the second one, and purple for forte. Forte is only calculated when it's less than one year. We see that our approximation in general performs better than the others. Okay, Loric is better than forte. Uh, our approximation is better than than the other ones. When row is zero. Even our approximation is much better. It is because the, the order of the approximation is new power six. So we improve a lot the approximation. So which are the conclusions that we have seen? The composition formula is a generic expansion of the stochastic volatility model, as well as other models, but that's a story for another day. Okay. To calculate prices, it's need to make an approximation formula. It is a recursive task. We need to apply the same query to each of the terms to improve the approximation. We can get we can get some intuition on some of them, like the Taylor expansion, that it's it's faster to approximate those terms. But the ones that the stochastic Taylor decomposition, this needs to be calculated in a regular way. It's difficult to, to know which terms are or who are the terms. Uh, we have found different approximations with different orders of magnitude. It seems like a lot of effort, but in the case of the Heston model, it can be calculated everything explicitly, which is quite nice. In our models, we are not so lucky, like a raw volatility model, so things get a little bit messy. Uh, the approximations are more accurate than other methods. Okay, this is what we have been seeing. Okay, if you want to see more about this, uh, there is a paper where we explain everything on detail is this paper, okay? So thank you to, to everyone, and, and that's all. Thank you very much, uh, Raul. So now it's time for questions and comments. I have one question, Raul. Have you tried to compare your approximation with the approximation by Hagan? and co-authors for the Sabor model? Um, I try to, to do and to play to the Sabor model. The problem is that when the volatility, well, the good thing about the Heston model is that the volatility is, is, is a mean reversion process. And that helps a lot in the approximation. When you change that to an exponential volatility model, the approximation is not working so well. Uh, I think that because the model is exponential, so it forces you to expand like a lot of of vulnerable terms. So I just tried the, the first approximation, the one that is similar to yours with one term. This is not working very well. Something that it's pending of research is how many terms you can approximate of the wall in order to try to, to fit Hagen. Is able to fit Hagen if you span more terms of the ball ball that is one of the of the open questions but in any case i think that you will have to to add a lot of terms because you're trying to linearize something that it's exponential so maybe for this type of models is not the best solution or the solution has to be changed a little bit or at least you will need a lot of terms to to fit it that is my my feelings around that but if you use um, stochastic models that have some mean reversion properties, I think that is going to, to work well. Okay. What they say is something that we have measured in the case of, of uh, beta equal to one in the paper of, of raw volatility model. And the problem with the raw volatility model is two. 
One is the conditional expectations are very hard to calculate. The other one is that the same as as, as Sable. So it's the idea, to... the idea, Raúl, if I understand, is that you need some kind of uh, uh, speed of mean reversion. Yeah, if you want to to make the model work well with few terms, I think that the the speed of mean reversion is is a key issue here. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, good morning. Javier? No. Yes. Okay. Hello, good morning. Congratulations for your conference. In Thank the black source much. formula, the hypothesis is the interest rate is positive. But now the interest well, rate is, is negative. Do you have to make any changes in the formula to make a good pricing? Thank you. No, it, it, work, it works in the same way. It, it doesn't change anything. It's just the classical hypothesis about interest rates. But if you put it negative, it works. Uh, it works in the same way. There was a similar question, for example, about Heston, because Heston has to fulfill an extra hypothesis to ensure that the, the volatility is positive. If the, the condition is not fulfilled, it works. So the, the approximation formula works with negative interest rates, and it works even the the sigma can, the volatility can reach zero. So so it's it's quite robust, like for an approximation price. Okay, thank you. Some more questions, comments. So if not, I think it's time to do the break. So we are going to come back at uh, half past 11. So take a coffee and see you then. Mavira. Yes, I have seen, uh, I am the organizer now. Yes, can you stop the recording and because I, let, yeah, I forgot. Sure. I'm doing. And uh, uh, good morning uh, to uh, everybody and uh, uh, welcome after this uh, coffee break. Uh, it's uh, uh, first of all a, a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, I would like to thank the organizers who have given me the opportunity to present this uh, uh, work uh, uh, that is a joint work with uh, uh, Michele Azzone who will end uh, uh, his PhD uh, next uh, uh, fall uh, uh, under my supervision. Uh, this talk uh, goes uh, in the line of research uh, that has been already well introduced by Uwe and uh, Masaki yesterday on modeling uh, uh, equity uh, underlines in order to price uh, equity derivatives. Uh, the idea uh, to start and to convince you to uh, uh, follow this uh, uh, brief talk after uh, your fast coffee uh, is to try to convince that we do need uh, a, another poor jam model for activities. And uh, this is uh, in order to uh, solve uh, the two kind of questions that were already put on the, on the floor uh, by Masaaki. Uh, first of all, in order to describe properly some stylized facts that are uh, in uh, the market, and second, uh, uh, in order to address the point of Uwe, uh, of having a quite simple model uh, that uh, allows to price exotics of first and second generation. And uh, um, we will discover that uh, this kind of modeling is not so far from uh, the uh, mixed uh, log normal presented by Uwe. And uh, we will start from uh, two questions and then introduce the additive process the, uh, relating them to the Levy process and uh, try to address uh, the main theoretical results. Then uh, we will 
continue uh, uh, trying to describe the calibration features of uh, this model, and in particular, the power law scaling properties that arise. And finally, we conclude. So do we need another pure jump model? The first question we would like to address is about calibration precision. And we would like to have a model, uh, the pure jump class, which is able uh, to uh, reproduce uh, exactly volatility structure. Let us uh, try to understand uh, with an example. Uh, let us consider the SP500 at the Manigol on the 30th of May, 2013, 11 a.m. New York time. And on red, there are the uh, liquid at the money uh, volatility points. And on blue, it's a classical model calibration. Okay. Unfortunately, we are not able to reproduce exactly the volatility. What we would like is, uh, like with the Google map, we would like to point uh, the, uh, the part of the curve, which is uh, quite far, put our finger on it, and move it on the, uh, the term structure of volatility in order to be able to reproduce exactly it. So this is uh, the first uh, thing on calibration. The second part uh, is about skew. Reddy Masaki has stressed that, uh, and this is, for example, the uh, Eurostock uh, case, uh, the same data, uh, this Q scales uh, with uh, one over the square root of T. Um, he has shown uh, some results uh, and uh, the first empirical results come from Karen Hu, uh, Journal of Finance 2003, and then uh, Fouquet uh, and co-authors and several others. Okay, second, we would like to have a parsimonious model. Parsimonious uh, means uh, uh, we would like, uh, once we have taken into account the old term structure of volatility, to have as few parameters as possible. And also, we would like that these few parameters have uh, a simple and direct financial interpretability. So to be connected to something that uh, Trader look at in the market in uh, the uh, philosophy that uh, I was explaining yesterday. Okay, so let us try uh, to understand what added process are, starting from Levy. Levy, everybody knows that uh, try to model uh, an underlying with a stationary and in, in independent increments and impose a, a stochastic continuity. Uh, Add the process maintain independent increments, but are non stationary. Excuse me, Roberto, I, I interrupt you because there is a question in the chat. So perhaps about a, a reference uh, that introduces additive processes in detail with applications, if possible. Yes, we will, uh, on additive, I will give you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, in order to have uh, all uh, uh, the people who are listening try to understand what an additive is and why uh, it can be useful to, uh, uh, to manage them, uh, is that they present infinite divisible marginal probability distribution as Levy and maintain several analytical and numerical properties of the Levy process. Uh, the reference book for additive is the Sato book, 1999, uh, who is uh, really uh, the mass book in this. But in finance, unfortunately, the application in finance are not so many. Uh, the first one I uh, know is uh, the one of uh, Carr and Coulter, 2007, uh, who introduced a self-similar process. Uh, in uh, uh, derivative pricing. And uh, uh, this, I, I believe uh, that was uh, the first application in this field. And for this reason, uh, they were called even a process. 
Then there is uh, uh, the paper of Bentley's Gara, who tried uh, to apply a very simple uh, anti process to uh, the electricity market. And more recently, Lee and Coulter uh, have uh, in 2016 in finance and stochastics have built a quite large class of additive process uh, via Levy subordination. Okay. Uh, so it's a quite large, but not so large class of additive process. Uh, let us try to understand uh, again, starting from Levy, in particular from a pure jump Levy process. Uh, what we would like to model is the forward, and that line forward, and is modeled by a, an exponential of a process, which is a Levy temperance table, normal temperance table, uh, which uh, can be written in this way. And the characteristic function is known. It depends on this function, and everything is known in the normal temperance table process. Uh, this can be found, for example, in the book of uh, Rama and uh, Peter, uh, or in, uh, in the book of V. Okay, uh, what is uh, uh, the kind of model that we would like to uh, introduce is an additive normal temperature stable uh, process. So instead of having a, a Levy, uh, we have an additive. So the forward is modeled as before with an exponential uh, of this form. And the characteristic function has exactly the same form of a Levy, but the three parameters that there were before that were sigma k, positive parameters, and eta, okay, just the three parameters, now become some deterministic uh, function of time, eta t, sigma t, and kt continues on zero or plus infinity. This is the change we would like to add. Is this possible? And here uh, comes our first uh, theoretical result where we provide a sufficient condition for the existence of such an additive uh, normal temperature state um, process also called a TS. Uh, we, uh, uh, I have to introduce uh, these uh, uh, three uh, deterministic function of time, G1, G2, and G3, which are function of the uh, eta t, sigma t, and kt, the three ones that were just parameters in Levy. If these are non-decreasing, and moreover, uh, t sigma t square eta t and these other function of sigma t eta t kt goes go to zero in t equal to zero. The second one is needed for the stochastic continuity. Uh, we have a uh, an additive process. So this looks quite cumbersome, but uh, from a calibration point of view, it's straightforward. Uh, in order to check this monotonicity is really something that is very simple to do in practice. Uh, it's uh, useful to give a rule to build additive process from additive process. And a very simple way to build additive process is that given an added process uh, ft and a real continuous increasing function rt, with r0 equal to 0, f of rt is still additive. And this plays a crucial role exactly in what we have said previously in order to uh, match the term structure of volatility within our model. The um, last uh, um, main theoretical result is to provide uh, an example of this additive process. And the example uh, is uh, uh, quite simple. And we see that the, uh, uh, I'll uh, look at the three function kt, eta t, and sigma. Sigma is constant. And kt and eta t are just power law in time where t is nothing else than time to maturity. Uh, 
the uh, parameter sigma uh, bar, eta, uh, k bar and uh, eta bar are uh, positive, whilst uh, in principle, uh, the scaling parameters beta and delta are uh, real. Alpha is the standard uh, parameter of the normal Kepler state. And we look that, uh, we see that uh, if these two conditions hold, uh, we have uh, an added temporal stable uh, uh, process. Uh, what do they mean? These are conditions for delta and beta, and they limit a region within the plane uh, that uh, uh, in the yellow zone, we have an added process. Okay, um, um, the uh, main uh, thing uh, of uh, uh, this result is to have a, a very simple ATS process and to see that the Levy case is just one possible additive. It's just the case where beta and delta are equal to zero. So correspond to this red dot. And we will discover that this blue triangle with beta equal to one and delta equal to minus one half will, pay, will play a key role in what follows. So what we have done, we have said, okay, we would like to have instead of just constant parameters, some functions of time for the three parameters. And we have said uh, the first theoretical result is that this is possible. And this second, gives a particular shape for these uh, function type. Okay, let us look at how uh, this uh, model performs in calibration. The data set that we consider is on the 30th of May 2013, 11 a.m. New York time, and we consider all liquid options on SP500, which involves six maturities, from 22 days up to almost two years, and the Eurostox 50 that involves nine maturities up uh, almost to five years. Okay, this, for example, is the surface of the SP500 in function of the maturity and log minus that uh, um, is similar to what Masaki has shown uh, on a different date. Okay. So what about the calibration performance? Uh, we can compare the calibration performance of our model with other two benchmark pure jump uh, process, uh, the Levy for sure, and the self-similar introduced by Carr and co in 2007. And we see that in terms of mean square error and mean average percentage error, the, uh, the uh, ATS model performs much better, almost two or order magnitude better in terms of mean square error. Okay, fine. Let us look at how it, uh, is, uh, it works uh, for the old surface, uh, considering the uh, different maturities. This is uh, for the SP500. And we see that the, uh, um, Self-similar um, model performs a little bit better than the Levy. This is in uh, order of magnitude. This is a log uh, scale. Instead of the ATS is much better in particular for short maturities. Okay. Even uh, uh, more than three order of magnitude. Okay. And this is the kind of plot that Masaki has shown. So just looking at uh, the volatility surface at a given time to maturity. And we see that uh, whilst for long maturities, for example, eight months, uh, the Levy and self-similar look not so far away from the market implied volatility even if uh, uh, the ATS performs much better. The uh, situation uh, changed completely in case of shore maturity. The, this is the shore maturity, liquid maturity uh, in the case that we have considered, 22 days. And we see that 
uh, they are quite far away from the uh, market data. But that, yes, uh, performs very well. In particular, we see that on the, uh, at the money, values uh, is uh, exact. Fine, what about the skew? And uh, this uh, is uh, uh, the case of Eurostox 50. And we see that uh, uh, the market and uh, the, the model are almost the same and they scale both as one over square root of t. Okay, so the calibration looks uh, uh, very nice, but we would like to understand a little bit uh, what happens and we make a change of time, a deterministic change of time with a new time theta, which is nothing else that sigma square multiplied by the time to intuitive. With this new time, clearly the volatility is constant. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, we impose that uh, k uh, theta and uh, eta theta uh, in this new time. Uh, we call it with a hat for this reason, as a, a power law scaling. And we would like to see how this kind of model works, both for SP500 and Eurostox 50. And these are the results. Uh, these uh, uh, here we have plotted as a Masaki, uh, since we would like to uh, see a power law scaling in a log log uh, scale. And uh, we see that the fit is uh, perfect. Uh, this is for uh, the SP500 case, and we have six maturities. And uh, uh, in particular, we see that uh, K uh, is uh, almost linear, his uh, uh, angular coefficient is almost one. And instead about eta, uh, one can see that this angular coefficient is almost minus one half. Okay. But what I would like to stress is that we are observing an implied volatility from 22 days up to two years. So the whole range of volatility available for liquid options. What about Euro stocks? And we observe exactly the same phenomenon uh, with the perfect feed of the power law uh, scaling and uh, but in this case, uh, we have options from 22 days up to five years. So a range of volatility that uh, looks uh, uh, absolutely different. There are different players on the short term, gamma players on the long term, uh, uh, long investment, uh, so uh, pension funds and so on. And we, uh, we observe a perfect power loss scale. Okay, so uh, after these plots, uh, it looks reasonable to try to test uh, if uh, beta is equal to one and delta is equal to minus one half. And these are the, uh, the parameters and the associated p value. And uh, uh, we can accept uh, the null hypothesis in all cases. Fine, so. What is our model? The model that we have shown is a model that in, in practice imposes perfect, uh, an exact reproduction of the term structure of volatility. And there are two more parameters. This k bar is multiplied by theta, since the uh, power law is uh, with a beta equal to one, and uh, a nita bar that is multiplied by theta minus one half, uh, since uh, our power law is minus one. So we have a part besides the whole term structure, only two parameters. And these two parameters uh, in the paper is explained, uh, and even in the paper you can find the proof of all uh, theoretical results of this study, uh, have a 
clear uh, interpretation. The first one is related to the vol of vol. Instead, uh, the second one is uh, a scooter. Okay. So what about the robustness of this? What we have done has been uh, to calibrate with a, a different set of uh, volatility surface six months before the 30th of May of 2013, three months before, three months after, and six months after. And we see that the calibration performance, uh, this uh, was uh, uh, the uh, mean square error in log scale, we see that the ATS performs much better than the other two uh, benchmark, on average, two order magnitude, and in, part, in some particular case, even four order magnitude. What about the skew? And in all cases, uh, here uh, we uh, uh, represented the, the Eurostop case just uh, three months before and three months after, but similar results are all in the other cases and can be found in the paper. Uh, we observe always the skew that scales one over the square root of t. And in all cases, we observe uh, a power law scaling for both the k theta and the eta theta. Okay. Fine. Let us conclude. I think it's time to conclude. Uh, and uh, uh, the conclusions are dedicated uh, to the football lovers. Okay, in our audience, uh, this is a picture taken from the. Uh, last penalty in the final uh, of uh, the European Championship. And uh, uh, there we have discovered that uh, uh, precision, reliability, and parsimony was crucial. And what we have shown uh, with this uh, new model, a new additive model, uh, is that uh, we have precision since uh, there is an exact fit of volatility term structure and uh, uh, reproduces the market skew. It is reliable since uh, it is built on uh, independent in increments and uh, uh, then can be easily simulated and is uh, as simple as uh, a pure jump levy. And is parsimonious since uh, besides the term structure of volatility, we have uh, two additional parameters that uh, can be easily calibrated. Um, since uh, uh, in the audience, uh, many of you knew well uh, Peter Lawrence, I think uh, is a must uh, to uh, give a special thank to Peter, uh, since uh, uh, these uh, research teams uh, were, uh, um, we have discussed uh, uh, several times, and so uh, I think uh, uh, it's really a must uh, to thank uh, for a countless number of reasons. Peter, here you can find a bibliography sketch. So I'm open to questions if any. Thank you, Roberto. And uh, as uh, Lisa anticipated, uh, um, it would be nice if you give reference for additive processes for some people who are interested in this uh, class. Okay, so the uh, the, uh, um, a mathematical um, uh, reference is uh, this uh, Sato book. Okay, it's an excellent book on Levy process and infinite divisible distribution, but uh, is on additive process, I think. Uh, um, uh, the, the main uh, properties are uh, proven in general for uh, um, the additive case. And uh, I have mentioned uh, the three uh, paper, uh, uh, these are three papers on additive application. And the first one is uh, uh, this car given uh, um, Madame Yor, 2007, on mathematical finance, uh, where uh, they uh, introduce uh, these uh, uh, set similar process also known after named uh, SATO process. And then 
Uh, more recently, the paper of Lili and Mendoza Ariaga uh, uh, on finance stochastic and introduce a quite large class of activity process. Thank you. I see Masaki with the hand raised, so probably you want to ask. Yes. Uh, Hello. Thank you. Uh, hi. Thank you, Roberto, for the nice talk. So uh, perhaps I missed something, but uh, so this uh, you, your ATS model. So TS stands for temporal stable. So you use a temporal stable uh, uh, model. But yes. At some point you may you show us some result with NIG or BG result. So I was a bit confused. So perhaps in some uh, empirical test uh, you showed us a result. Uh, with, with some uh, rows, where some rows are for NYG and uh, some rows for VG. So you use uh, variance gamma and... Uh, yes. Knowing. I was a bit confused. What, 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 how they are related? Okay. Th thanks a lot for the question. Uh, the Levy temper uh, normal temper stable process and the additive uh, ones. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, are have in general an alpha, uh, which is uh, between zero and one. Okay, if uh, you select zero, you have a variance gamma. Alpha oh. equal to one half. Okay, uh, you have a, a normal inverse Gaussian. Ah, I see. So uh, are the uh, these are the only two cases where you know even the density, not only the uh, Cartesian function. Okay, uh, for all normal temporal stable, you know the Cartesian function. Okay. In the other two cases that are the ones uh, mostly used in the literature, uh, you have uh, even the density and several other properties. Okay. Uh, but the all results have been shown for marketing purposes uh, just for alpha equal to zero and alpha equal to one alpha. And this is why I speak about when I, uh, for example, I consider the test. Okay. Mm -hmm. The results are for NIG and uh, various gamma mean alpha equal to zero and alpha equal to one alpha. But the results are general for every alpha, okay? So it means, so you fix alpha and you did not calibrate alpha. No, I don't calibrate alpha, okay? Uh, uh, what we observe is that the worst performer is the variance gamma. And you see, for example, in the test, okay? When we compare, okay? you see uh, that the p-values for beta equal to one and delta equal to minus one alpha in the variance gamma case, uh, it's uh, just 5%, okay? It's the uh, estimation is 1.08. And one can see that even the mean square error is a little bit worse, but not dramatically worse, okay? For the other alpha, uh, different from zero, it performs extremely well. And it's trivial. For you, you can check immediately, okay? It's uh, like uh, a Levy uh, routine minimization and uh, you can perform immediately, even in only. Nice. Okay. So okay. thank you. If there are no other. Thanks a lot, uh, Masaki. Okay, for your question. I hope that I have replied. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, Roro had uh, raised the hand, but uh, no, I don't see the hand again. I don't know if. No, the hand was by Masaki. Okay. No, yeah. there, there was another hand. Okay. There is. Oh, yes, there is Zororo. Sorry. And uh, you can speak if you want. Okay, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, still on the same question from the previous uh, uh, colleague, on this same slide here, I want to just ask, uh, the NIG, VG are all uh, additive, NIG, additive, VG, and ed additive, all of them? Exactly. Uh, when uh, we, uh, for example, here compare Here, uh, uh, 
Uh, when uh, I compare LBM self similar, I, I mean uh, here is alpha equal to one half, and here is alpha equal to zero. Okay, for the three different models. In all the three models, there is alpha. Okay, and uh, uh, we compare. Uh, is not optimized for alpha. I hope uh, that this clarifies. Okay, and generally. Uh, the, they are known as a variance gamma and MIG. So I left the usual vocabulary. But these, in this case, is a normal inverse Gaussian with an additive normal temperature stable. Okay. Okay. I think uh, Zoro said it is okay. So if there are no other questions, maybe. I thanks Roberto again, and uh, I ask to the next speaker, which is Anna Kopinkova, who, uh, yes, you are there. I let you be the uh, co-organizer so that you can uh, present. Okay, uh, can you hear me? I you are perfectly. Okay. Maybe you, Thank you. okay, mm -hmm. we still see Roberto uh, slide, so please Roberto, take it off so that Anna can present. Okay, okay. yes, Anna, you, my, you can share your share slide. My screen. Okay. Yes, it's coming. Okay. Um, Perfect. This. So, okay. Yes. So, everything will be. So, so I you... introduce Anna Kopinkova and uh, she presented paper on the influence of various stochastic gradient, gradient descent methods in deep pricing rough volatility. So thank you. And you have half an hour presentation. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's nice to join uh, this conference. Uh, so uh, this talk is about uh, Adam type uh, SGD uh, numerical methods, which uh, can be used for uh, deep pricing, and this uh, work was created together with uh, Jan Pospisil. So, uh, a common approach uh, to valuing financial derivative uh, securities involve uh, choosing a model, and then uh, we have to choose its parameters to fit uh, the volatility or price uh, surface uh, as closely as uh, possible. Uh, there exist several uh, recent papers uh, that uh, try uh, to apply the model calibration ap approach uh, to rough uh, fractional models, but none of them uh, tries to optimize the training phase by choosing a suitable uh, SGD method. Uh, so this is uh, our main theme uh, for today's talk. So the first, uh, here, is, uh, here are uh, the most uh, important links for presented uh, numerical methods. Uh, uh, the known uh, ADEM, uh, ADEM method uh, was uh, published in uh, 2015. Um, and uh, the methods we will compare uh, with ADEM is uh, usually called Adam W, or uh, it's a uh, decoupled way to say uh, regularization uh, with Adam, and uh, we call it Q uh, QH Adam. It's a quasi hyperbolic uh, momentum and Adam. So uh, it's a few years ago uh, where was published this uh, new uh, Adam type methods. So uh, first part of this talk is uh, to present different uh, Adam type SGD numerical methods and their uh, application to some standard um, simple uh, tasks and compare with uh, Adam method. Uh, the second part is about their influence to calibration results. 
So let me start with uh, classical stochastic gradient descent. Uh, it's a well-known uh, method, easy for understanding. Uh, it's uh, implemented in almost all optimizing software. And uh, Adam type uh, method is in this uh, family. So um, the, there is uh, some necessary parameters uh, settings and the main loop is here. Uh, so it's known that uh, we um, um, compute uh, actual gradient with respect uh, some selected variables. And uh, this is easy updating formula uh, where we uh, use only uh, actual gradient and uh, choosing rail, uh, learning rate. So, uh, all, uh, um, we illustrate uh, behavior of uh, all presented method um, uh, on a very simple task. We want to minimize uh, Rosenberg function. Uh, um, sometimes it's, uh, it is called a banana function. Uh, it is non-convex um, function with this formula and this shape. And uh, our, all our tests, we start at point minus two, two. So we start somewhere here and we want to uh, get as close as possible uh, to exact minimum and exact minimum is in point one, one. So somewhere uh, here we want to uh, take somewhere close to here. Uh, this uh, function is uh, very good for first te testing of numerical methods because some of them can fail on this ship. So let's uh, try SGD. Um, you can see red line is a uh, um, uh, process of minimizing, so it's in good shape, but uh, if we uh, look at around the minimum, it's a green point, it's here and here, it's exact uh, minimum. So uh, this method does not catch minimum after 80,000 uh, steps. So uh, this is not uh, good for uh, uh, this. Um, shape. So uh, for interest, you can see the blue the blue points. Uh, it's uh, uh, progress after uh, 500 steps. So you can see here from here, uh, optimizing becomes slowly, very slowly. Optimi uh, optimizing process become very slowly. So start with Adam. Um, Again, some uh, necessary uh, settings. And uh, this is a basic loop. Um, um, maybe better for your. Uh, okay, this is a basic uh, loop for Adam uh, here. Uh, is the same uh, steps as uh, SGD. And we have little different uh, updating formula. Uh, this uh, in SGD uh, is only actual gradient, but here we have to compute uh, first moment vector, it's uh, empty, and its correction. It's this one, head uh, empty, and the then we compute second uh, moment vector and its correction. And updating formula use this uh, corrected uh, first and second moment vector. Um, these uh, vectors are computed by new uh, parameters, beta one and beta two. Um, and uh, you, in this article, uh, you can find some uh, recommended or um, default uh, setting uh, with, uh, which is good to start with. So uh, there is a one another parameter. It's a small number uh, epsilon. And um, this uh, 
number um, uh, it's only because we uh, we don't want to uh, divide by zero. So uh, how it uh, works for our very easy task, um, we use default setting. And uh, you can see that um, shape is very good. Uh, the progress process of minim minimalization uh, is very good. And uh, minim uh, minimum is uh, catched uh, after 60,000 uh, six, uh, steps. So uh, this method works well, better than SGD. So let's uh, go to um, uh, Adam W. Um, it's a similar as Adam, but there is a two, uh, the loop is almost the same. And uh, there is a new uh, parameter called lambda weight to say, uh, which, uh, which is here and here. So we little transform, we can transform uh, computed gradient. And also we can transform a little bit uh, the updating formula. Uh, the other uh, parameters and other computations are the same as uh, in the atom. Um, if uh, you choose uh, the lambda number as a zero, so this vanished, also this, we get the same algorithm as Adam. So it not makes sense to choose uh, lambda zero because it's Adam. Uh, we don't find any uh, in this uh, articles, uh, in this article, we, um, I don't find any, well, let's say default settings for Lambda or recommended setting. So uh, we try something and this, uh, this choice become uh, the best one for all our tasks. So we fix beta uh, one and beta two and epsilon as uh, for Adam. And we try uh, take uh, weight Lambda uh, in this uh, in this shape, so it works well. It uh, in fact it works very similarly as Adam, and we catch uh, um, minimum. So last algorithm, last method we uh, uh, choose is uh, called quasi uh, hyperbolic Adam or QH Adam, and it's, if you uh, look at uh, the basic loop, um, you can see uh, it's a uh, very similar uh, to Adam again, but uh, there is a change, a uh, little change in uh, updating formula. Uh, here, uh, we also need to compute first moment vector and its correction, second moment vector and its corrections. But here uh, we have another combination. Um, it's a combination between corrected first moment vector, actual corrected, uh, corrected uh, act uh, moment vector and actual gradient. Here it's a combination uh, of second moment vector or corrected second moment vector and uh, element-wise uh, squared gradient actual gradient. If we choose new parameters, uh, new one and new two as one, so this and this vanished, so we have the same algorithm as Adam. So it does not make sense choose uh, one and one. Uh, Again, uh, here in this article, you can find some uh, recommended uh, uh, value setting for uh, new parameters. So let's uh, um, 
see uh, uh, what uh, um, how uh, the QH Adam work for our uh, function uh, minimiz um, function minimization. So in this uh, figure, you can see that shape is good. It works look works well, but if we zoom uh, around uh, or uh, close to minimum, uh, there is uh, some uh, funny behavior and uh, it uh, looks like some something like a zigzag effect. So this method uh, uh, give a, for this task the worst uh, result, uh, worse than uh, Adam and Adam W. So it's a first touch. Uh, with uh, these uh, new methods and let's try um, another uh, typical task uh, for deep learning. Uh, it's uh, identification of hand right digits, uh, digits. So uh, this is also <laughs> a very typical uh, task for uh, uh, testing uh, how the method works. So. Uh, we have many hand write digits. Uh, each of uh, image uh, uh, has uh, uh, 28 times 28 uh, um, um, uh, digits, and each digit uh, has a number. And this number represents color. Zero is white, and uh, 255 means black. Um, the numbers between are uh, shades of gray. So input uh, into our neuron uh, network, neural network, uh, is uh, this uh, numbers, 28 times uh, 28, uh, represent color. Um, then we choose uh, two hidden layers, uh, 500 neuron, uh, neurons each. And output it uh, represent what uh, number is uh, written in image. Uh, so from zero to nine, ten possibilities. So uh, here um, there is uh, some there are some unnecessary parameters for uh, calculations. We choose sigmoid activating function, categorical cross entropy loss function. This is amount of training set, amount uh, of test set, batch size. Uh, we choose uh, 100, uh, 20 epochs, and this is uh, default parameter settings for all our uh, testing methods. Uh, we uh, make a little different learning rate. And here is a little, little bit different lambdas. So let's try what uh, is uh, our results. SGD method works uh, very bad. Uh, this is a um, uh, reason we will omit this method for uh, another calculations because uh, uh, over a thousand incorrect identifications has SGD. Uh, Adam types method uh, works much more better. Uh, in fact, in this task, Adam and QH Adam works almost the same. Uh, result and um, the best one uh, from this task uh, is uh, best one uh, become um, Adam W. So um, now um, we uh, uh, finally we will uh, apply this knowledge to task to really interest us. So uh, deep neural network pricing and calibration of stochastic uh, volatility models. Uh, 
we choose Heston model and rough fractional stochastic volatility models uh, in concrete rough bergom. Um, we were inspired by this, uh, this article where uh, the calibration is calculated using Adam with uh, default setting. So uh, uh, here is a link uh, to codes. Uh, we also use uh, for our calculation. So uh, we um, have the same uh, neural network as in uh, mentioned article. Uh, uh, input is n uh, of uh, model parameters. Uh, we have four hidden layers, each uh, neurons each, and output is uh, uh, values uh, representing uh, implied volatility uh, grid. So uh, some uh, necessary settings for uh, neural network. Uh, we choose a loop activating uh, function, root mean squared error loss function. This is amount of training set, amount of test set. Batch size is 32, 20, uh, to, uh, 200 uh, epochs. Model parameters uh, uh, is normalized uh, linearly to uh, the, uh, interval minus one one. So uh, here is uh, uh, model parameters, uh, and we I think uh, we can go to our. Uh, um, uh, results. So uh, you can see uh, overall results for whole test set. Uh, this first figures, uh, it's for Adam. And uh, we compare with this one. Uh, you can find this in uh, codes, uh, in present, in mentioned codes, and uh, I think in mentioned article also. So uh, this is our computation. Uh, you can see uh, there is a little different layout um, uh, of uh, maximum uh, relative and average relative error for Adam W and QH Adam. Uh, if uh, we want uh, compare one number, so uh, I uh, uh, um, compute uh, maximum error, so uh, we can see that uh, it's a little better uh, only if we change uh, optimizer with default setting. So it's for relative error. And uh, we also uh, plot um, uh, absolute error for Adam. So uh, again, you can see a little different layout, especially here and here. But uh, if uh, we uh, look at uh, the maximum uh, error, uh, we Adam B, uh, Adam W and QH Adam uh, become better, a little better. So now uh, we plot uh, one particular calibration uh, each picture uh, show one slice of uh, volatility survey, surface per maturity. And uh, what you can see, uh, the red line is Adam. It's from, in fact, from article. And uh, the green and black line is uh, our uh, computations. Uh, green line for Adam W and black line uh, QH Adam, uh, especially in this three uh, pictures, you can see that Adam is uh, the worst one. Uh, so uh, we have, I uh, don't know what time we have, so go to Raf Bergome model and the same results, same computation for Raf uh, Bergome model. Here you can see. Uh, the uh, same <laughs> pictures are uh, relative uh, error for Adam. So he, uh, this is pictures we compare with. 
and this is our computation. You can see that uh, Adam and Adam W works almost the same. There is a little, little better, let's say, um, number here, uh, but uh, QH Adam works uh, uh, much more better. Uh, so if you uh, look at the maximum, uh, uh, it's uh, twice uh, uh, twice as good. So uh, same. Um, um, uh, result we uh, plot for absolute uh, error, and here it's uh, it's, it's uh, you can see that uh, QH Adam for this task works very well. And also, uh, again, one, um, we brought uh, one particular calibration. Each picture shows one slice of uh, volatility surface per maturity. Uh, again, red line is Adam, and we want to be better. So green and black line it's uh, for our computation and you can see uh, uh, it's uh, better <laughs> yeah. so uh, i think it's uh, time to end so uh, some uh, conclusion uh, our conclusion uh, is that we can get better uh, results for calibration only by changing the optimization methods uh, with the default parameters. Uh, so it's a good news because um, we uh, don't have to find some ideal combination. We can, we can, of course, we can. And uh, we um, can find even better results. But if we don't, we uh, can get better results only if we change optimization methods. So thank you for your attention. I think uh, I'm in time. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, Thank you, Anna, um, for your deep presentation. And uh, are there questions, comments for the audience? Yes, Raul, please. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very nice. Um, I have a question is that when we, when you were showing us the difference between the between them, we have seen that in the Heston model, the best one was, I think, that the middle one that was Adam double B. But in the rough one, the best was QH Adam. Do you have feeling why, depending on the model, one method works better than the other? Oh, well, in fact, um, we. Uh... Uh, no, um, in um, Adam W, um, the computations are very sensitive how you choose uh, the weight. And because uh, I didn't find any recommendation or any default settings for lambdas, I try uh, the presented one. Uh, it's a, it's a, this, uh, this, in fact, this shape. Uh, but if uh, we uh, change a little bit this this number, uh, we can get little different, uh, sometimes um, different and usually little different uh, results. So Adam W, uh, it's uh, and QH Adam has uh, default settings, but this not so. My uh, opinion is that. Uh, we have to be very uh, careful for how to set uh, weight in Adam W. 
because there is no recommendation. Uh, so this this uh, this way uh, uh, is work uh, is working for all our tasks, but um, in fact I tried uh, uh, do it better, and I can. Uh, but you have to uh, change a little bit uh, all parameters. So I can uh, get better results, uh, especially in uh, number identification and MNIST, uh, even if uh, um, for QH Adam and also in uh, for uh, Adam W. Um, so, uh, because there are a uh, little different uh, update formula, so uh, for all um, for uh, each task, it can work a little different. So I have no uh, answer. I don't know why. I think it's because uh, different uh, uh, different. Uh, update formula and here we uh, we a little change uh, there is a little changing of uh, actual gradient so <laughs> what about the time and speed in each method the time that you need to compute the neural network is similar for each type or yeah. there is one that is faster than I don't know. it's the uh, similar very similar okay and have you tried to, to mix the models, start with one model and find kind of a possible solution and then try to, to use a seed for the other one? Uh, it's uh, our uh, future work. So we uh, try to uh, this um, uh, mixture of uh, methods. So start with, uh, in fact, we, uh, the Adam W, we start with Adam because uh, the first, uh, uh, lambda is zero. So in these steps, um, um, the method is working as a dem. And then we uh, make it uh, hopefully better. Uh, but it, it, uh, this is uh, our future uh, work. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice talk. No, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Again, uh, other comment, question? Not in the chat. So maybe uh, I thank again, Anna, for the very nice presentation. And uh, I pass to the next speaker, which is uh, Giacomo Toscano. And uh, I ask Anna to close the mm -hmm. presentation so i give sure. to okay okay yeah you are organizer and you can share your presentation okay do you see it yes we can see and we can hear you so Giacomo Toscano uh, presented paper on rate efficient asymptotic normality for the for the estimator of leverage process, you have half an hour and no more because it is lunch time. Very close. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much for for having me in this in this workshop. As uh, Professor Mancino said, I'm going to present a work on the on the Fourier estimator of uh, of the leverage process. Uh, I will discuss some uh, first some. Uh, technical theoretical results and then I will uh, briefly describe some um, empirical uh, econometric uh, application but uh, and of course this is a joint work with me and uh, um, Professor Mancino. Okay so I will start by giving a bit of uh, context on, uh, on, uh, on what is the leverage effect and why maybe uh, interesting or relevant to, to estimate such uh, such effect. So this effect dates back to to the, the identification of this effect dates back to the to the 70s uh, uh, to the study of, of Black 1976, who uh, identified the, the existence of um, of a stylized fact on financial market that is the the, the negative correlation between uh, 
uh, asset returns and uh, and changes in the in the volatility, which is something that uh, uh, still nowadays is typically observed on uh, on equity markets. So the name leverage effect comes from the from the explanation that Black gave of this uh, of this phenomenon. He, um explain that uh, a change in the price of the of the of the asset of the company changes the the debt to equity ratio of the company because the the value of the equity uh, changes so as a result of this the company becomes either more risky or less risky depending on the on this on the sign of the of the price change okay so eventually a change in the risk profile causes a change in the in the volatility, so this is the etymology, if you will, of this uh, of the name of this phenomenon. But empirical evidence suggests that the mechanism may be actually uh, um, may follow a different causal, uh, a reverse causal uh, mechanism. That is, is, some studies starting from uh, French and co-authors 1987 suggest that it is the volatility that causes uh, uh, the price to change. So there is no uh, Consensus on the, on the causal mechanism that drives the uh, the leverage effect, no shared consensus. But at the same time, the effect is uh, is very present. There is in, in the data there is a, a huge literature on the, on this uh, continuous time stochastic volatility models. Uh, usually, are able to to reproduce this effect, but there are also uh, discrete models in the Gatch family that are able to reproduce these effects. Uh, but overall, in, the, in recent times, there is um, a strong agreement on the fact that this phenomenon, the leverage effect, is a time-dependent and random phenomenon. So you see a number of papers, re relatively recent papers, that address uh, um, the proposed model and estimators for, the, for a uh, time-dependent random leverage effect. So bottom line, it is uh, interesting for applications to, to have efficient estimates of the leverage effect because uh, the leverage effect appears is relevant for uh, uh, risk management, for volatility forecasting, and we have a little empirical exercise on this at the end of this uh, presentation. It is relevant for more calibration and many other uh, financial applications. So uh, we um, start going into the details of the of the theoretical result that we obtain. We work under this non-parametric assumption on, uh, on the log price X and the volatility uh, V, which are both uh, continuous semi-martingales. Okay, so we are, in, uh, I stress the fact that we work in a non-parametric uh, um, uh, setting. And the process that we are interested in is the, um, instantaneous covariation between X, the log price, and the, uh, the volatility. Specifically, we uh, derive a rate efficient central limit theorem for uh, uh, the integral of this, of this process here, eta. Okay? And we do this by using the, the Fourier methodology, which was introduced by Maliaven and Mancino. Okay, and we work, as I said, under the, the non-parametric assumption H. Okay, so uh, for, for, uh, for, for simplicity, we, we, uh, we derive our results on the interval from zero to, uh, to pi by assuming that the price uh, is uh, um, sampled, the log price X is sampled on a, on a grid with mesh size uh, rho n uh, given by 2 pi over n, but in general, of course, when we move to application, we can easily rescale the, the unit of time to work on, a, on an arbitrary interval from zero to capital T, which usually uh, is uh, in applications one trading day. Okay, and we define specifically two different estimators, uh, Fourier estimators of, uh, of the integrated uh, leverage effect, which are obtained using two different kernels to um, to compute the convolution between the coefficients of the process V, the volatility, and the coefficients of the of the log returns. Uh, so um, that uh, 
what is key here is to uh, to notice that the estimators doesn't does not only depend on the number of prices uh, small n that we use but also on capital n and capital m and capital uh, n appears here when we compute the coefficients of the of the volatility while capital m appears here when we compute the convolution to obtain uh, uh, the zeroth coefficients of the of the leverage, which is uh, also here. Um, what if what is the difference between these two estimators is the kernel, as I said, that we use for for the for the convolution. In the first case, estimator one, we use the Dirichlet uh, kernel. In case uh, of estimator two, we use the Feger kernel. We will see that the use of this uh, kernel, the different kernels, will have an impact on the asymptotic variance. Uh, of the uh, of the estimation error so uh, we studied the uh, the central limit theorem for these two estimators and we obtain uh, the following uh, result this is for the first estimator the one with the uh, with the Riclet kernel uh, as i said what is crucial is the role of capital m and capital n so we show that under some condition on the on the rate of divergence of uh, capital n and capital m uh, and capital n sorry uh, we prove that the estimation error so the difference between the estimator and the quantity we want to estimate uh, scaled by some uh, rate of um, of convergence goes to as the number of prices goes to infinity goes to a gaussian distribution with mean zero uh, and uh, a variance which is uh, given by this structure here okay so um, what is the difference between the, the first estimator and the second one? The difference is, as I said, in the structure of the asymptotic variance. Specifically, if you observe these uh, two numbers here, you will see that when you apply the, the Feger kernel to, to compute the estimator, the asymptotic variance is, uh, is smaller because here you have 2 thirds and 2 over 15. Here you have basically one, which does not appear, and one over six. So if you uh, apply, uh, if you use the Feger kernel, you obtain an asymptotic variance, which is uh, uh, smaller than in the case of the use of the Dirichlet kernel under the same conditions on uh, capital M and capital N. Okay, so um, these are the two theoretical results that we, that we obtain. Uh, what is relevant is some comments on the, the asymptotic efficiency of these, uh, uh, of these estimators. The asymptotic rate that we obtain is one fourth, uh, which is the same rate which is obtained by the estimators proposed in Etzali and Jacob and Mikland and Wong. These estimators differ, differ from, from our estimators because these are obtained uh, uh, via the realized uh, um, covariance between the the spot volatility and uh, and uh, and the log returns. Uh, clearly, the spot volatility is not observable, so it is the, actually the realized covariance between estimates of the of the spot volatility and the uh, and the returns. Uh, based on the on the seminal work by Aitzali and Jacob, this rate one fourth is uh, is uh, the optimal rate. So, in some sense, we. Um, we, we show that the, the Fourier estimator achieves the, the, the same rate, uh, optimal rate as the um, competitor estimators based on the, um, on the realized covariance. And also what we see is that uh, um, the asymptotic variance that we achieve is actually a little bit smaller than, uh, than the realized estimator. So based on this, uh, on the, on this uh, uh, theoretical result, the Fourier uh, estimator is, uh, uh, is more efficient asymptotically. But also another key aspect that is more related to, to, um, to numerical matters uh, is that the Fourier estimator as a, uh, as a, um, does not require the pre-estimation of, uh, of the volatility but only the, esti the, the estimation of the volatility coefficients which appear uh, here, okay? which is achieved by, by integration, not by differentiation. 
uh, as in the case of the pre-estimation of the of the latent spot volatility for uh, realized estimators. So this is an advantage because uh, the computation of the coefficients is numerically more stable than the computation of the spot volatility uh, via differentiation. So this has a lot of um, impact on the finite sample performance of the of the estimator. So this is one aspect that uh, um, highlights the, the strength of the Fourier estimator in uh, 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 finite sample applications. Okay, so um, we also uh, perform a simulation study to support our uh, asymptotic results. Specifically, we focus on the, um, on the selection of the optimal selection of the of the constant CM, which is this one, this one here that appears uh, uh, in the statement of the theorem. Okay, uh, we do not uh, ad address numerically the study of the constant CN because we know from theory that in the absence of uh, of microstructure noise, we it, it it is optimal to select capital N equal to the Nyquist frequency, and also this selection. Uh, allows to cancel uh, this term here in the variance. Okay, this expression theta, when you select CN uh, such that capital N is the Nyquist fre frequency, this term uh, is zero. So we cut off a, a, a term in the asymptotic variance. So um, we focus on CM only. Uh, and what we do is that we simulate some uh, trajectories, a thousand trajectories, uh, so, sorry, 10,000 trajectories from, uh, from the Eston model using some parameter selection from, uh, from the literature. Uh, each, each trajectory corresponds to, uh, to one trading day. So for each day, what we do is we compute the integrated leverage with the, with the two estimators that we have derived and compare the performance with the true integrated leverage, which is something that we can do with the, with the simulated trajectories of the price and the volatility. Okay, so what we see is that uh, in relation to the selection of the constant CM, here you see kappa is simply uh, here, CM scaled by square root of two pi. What we see, the red line is the mean square error for the Fourier estimator with Dirichlet kernel. Uh, while the blue line is the mean square error for the Fourier estimator with Fege kernel. So what we see is that the performance of the of the second one, the blue one, is uh, is better. Okay, and so um, sorry, maybe I said the, the opposite colors. So the red one, of course, is the is the Fege, and the blue one is the Dirichlet kernel. Sorry, but anyway, the performance of the red one is the is the best, relatively best uh, compared to the other, and uh, uh, this is in line with what we expect from asymptotic theory because, as I said, uh, the asymptotic variance in the case of the Fege kernel is uh, is smaller. So even in finite samples, we find that uh, uh, in our uh, simulation exercise, the asymptotic variance is uh, is smaller, and this optimizes in correspondence of a of uh, k equal to one, uh, while in the case of the, of the estimator with Dirichlet kernel, the optimal choice is k equal to 0 0.4 in our simulations. Okay, so this offers also some guidance for the selection of CM, the constant CM when we work with uh, uh, empirical data. Uh, so also to, to give support to the, um, to the asymptotic results that we obtain, we compared the the, the, the empirical density of the of the estimation error in correspondence of different values of the of, of increasing values of uh, of the sample size uh, small n and what we see we see that the blue line which is the empirical density as I said of the estimation error uh, standardized by by the um, the expected uh, theoretical variance becomes closer and closer to the uh, normal zero one. Uh, which is uh, uh, the, the normal zero one density, which is in red, as the uh, the number of prices small n is increased. So this also offers some uh, 
support to our uh, uh, theoretical result. Okay, so after uh, considering uh, deriving the, the theoretical result and providing simulations that support those results, uh, we move to an empirical exercise where we analyze uh, uh, the empirical performance of the of the the leverage estimator obtained with the Fourier methodology on uh, a fairly long sample of S&P 500 uh, uh, prices that goes from 2006 to, 2000, uh, to, to 2018. Okay, so um, a long period of time that encompasses some periods where the market was, uh, was, uh, was calm, but also some periods where the market was uh, was uh, in uh, in distress. Okay, so here on the on the left you see in blue the uh, the daily integrated uh, leverage reconstructed using the Fourier estimator with the uh, Fege kernel, which gave the the relatively best performance in in simulations. And on the right you see the the integrated daily volatility in red for the same uh, period of time. So what we can see from these, uh, the comparison of these two graphs is that the leverage uh, in blue is, uh, it, it appears to be close to zero, but if you trust me, this depends on the, on the scale of the graph, the, the average uh, of the blue line is uh, slightly negative. So it confirms that the, 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 core, the covariance is, uh, is uh, on average uh, negative, but these huge spikes in blue happen roughly in correspondence of, of volatility spikes. For example, here uh, in uh, uh, around 2008, in correspondence of the financial crisis, we see a huge, uh, uh, we see huge spikes in the, in the integrated leverage. Also in May 2000, uh, 2010, in correspondence of the flash crash, you, we see a, a, a huge negative spike uh, spike in the leverage. Also in 2011, when we have the, the euro crisis, 2016 in correspondence of Brexit and the, the presidential election in the, the United States, and also at the end of the sample in correspondence of the trade war between uh, the United States and China. So uh, the leverage effect reacts. Uh, it is really a, um, a time-dependent random process that reacts to uh, turbulent periods, to uh, high volatility periods. So this empirical evidence that we find is in line with the findings of Bang and Renault, uh, Kalin XU, that highlights that uh, uh, the leverage effect is actually higher during uh, uh, bad times, meaning turbulent periods with uh, high volatility. Okay, so we finish with uh, um, an, an, an empirical uh, exercise related to the forecasting of uh, future volatility uh, using the, also the information that comes from, uh, from the leverage. Uh, our study is based on the study by, by Mikan and Wong 2014, who, uh, as I said, study uh, the predictive power of the leverage effect on, on future volatility. Their starting point is the, um, what they notice uh, is that under the non-parametric assumption H, so if the price and volatility are to continue semi-marking, uh, we can simply rewrite the dynamics of, uh, of the volatility uh, this way. So we have a red term here, which is uh, the ratio between the the spot leverage and spot volatility multiplied by the increment of the, of the, of the log price, plus an orthogonal term here and the drift. So they focus on this red term and they argue that, uh, although they conjecture that uh, uh, this relation uh, between the volatility and the leverage, which is obtained at the high frequency uh, infinitesimal level may be useful to uh, forecast the volatility also at the daily or the weekly or the monthly uh, level. So basically they investigate the predictive power on the future volatility of the, of the ratio between the leverage and, 
volatility itself. And they actually show using the a sample of Microsoft prices over the period 2008-2011 that uh, if they use uh, an autoregressive model for the two-day integrated variance, uh, they use two day instead of one day because the um, their estimator, which is a realized estimator, uh, same as um, the one proposed by Jacob de Naitzalia, their estimator, uh, due to the numerical instabilities related to the computation of the of the spot variance, uh, does not really is not really efficient on the typical one day horizon. So they are forced to use a two day horizon. But anyway, they propose an autoregressive model of order two for the volatility augmented by the ratio, uh, with the ratio between the integrated leverage and the integrated volatility multiplied by the, the price increment. So what we do is uh, uh, we try to test if their result holds also with the um, benchmark model for volatility forecasting, which is the HAR model by, by Corsi 2009. So we augment the same way they do with the autoregressive model of order two, we augment the HAR model with this red term, which is the integrated sort of equivalent of the high frequency uh, instantaneous term that appears here. So uh, the, auto, uh, the heterogeneous autoregressive model by Corsi uh, assumes that the integrated volatility uh, of the next day is a linear function of the uh, integrated volatility of the previous day plus the integrated volatility of the previous week and the integrated volatility of the previous month. So if beta four is equal to zero, we have the original HAR model by Corsi. What we do, as I said, we add this, uh, this term and we test if this, uh, uh, extra term gives a statistically significant contribution to uh, to forecasting the the future volatility. Clearly, in the in the spirit of Mikland and Wong, our aim is not to find the best forecasting volatility model. It's just to 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 propose a simple uh, exercise that shows that the information coming from the leverage effect is. Uh, relevant for the for forecasting the future volatility. In fact, what we what we find here, we compare the estimates of model five, model five is exactly this one, with the, the original simple HAR model, which has beta four equal to zero. Uh, we, we give the estimates of the of the coefficient and between brackets we have the p-values of uh, of each coefficient estimated. So what we see is that the adjusted R square uh, is slightly increased when we uh, add the, the leverage effect to our to our model. But this could be also due to the simply to the fact that we are overfitting, that we are adding uh, an extra an extra variable. Um, what is more relevant, uh, in my opinion, is that the likelihood ratio test that we perform uh, uh, is a p-value, which is basically zero, suggesting that uh, um, the null hypothesis that the two models, model five and the original HAR model, carry the same uh, explanatory power uh, may be uh, rejected. So uh, this test, uh, supports the fact that uh, adding the information from uh, from the leverage effect uh, improved the forecasting power of uh, uh, autoregressive uh, volatility models. Okay, so, so that's all uh, from me. Thank you for uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, I would be um, glad to to answer. Thank you, Giacomo. Are there some comment? Curiosity. Is no a question? Well, I suppose I am not the best to ask a question to 
this paper, maybe what is uh, some uh, is use that uh, you are uh, you think is interesting about uh, the leverage also for understanding uh, the model behavior. In the, there are two applications that come uh, come to my mind. The first one is that you can use the leverage in a, maybe this is a, some uh, 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 well explored field, but at the same time still relevant. You can use the leverage uh, estimate for model calibration. So for any model, you can reconstruct some uh, uh, parameters based on specifically the correlation between the the um, the two Brownian motions that drive this, uh, the price and the volatility can be reconstructed using the leverage effect. Another more recent um, application is the study of the of the sensitivity of uh, of the of the leverage effect to to changes in the in the volatility and uh, and the leverage and the, sorry and the, and the price. So in in that case. Uh, uh, this is a, a field which is, I think, is, uh, is relatively uh, new, and uh, you can have some interesting application where you where you study how the leverage effect reacts uh, um, to changes in the in the component in the process that uh, uh, compose the leverage effect, namely the the log price and the, and the volatility. Okay. If there are no, I have a question. Yeah, uh, I, I see that you need to choose uh, two numbers and I'm um, M if I am N M. Okay. What about the optimal choice of these parameters? Okay, so um, as I said, for, for this one, okay, the optimal choice is basically choosing the, the Nyquist frequency. So it is uh, capital N equal to and no divided by two. So this is optimal from a theoretical point of view, but also because you uh, sort of uh, uh, cut off this, uh, this term here. If you select uh, uh, capital N equal to small n divided by two, this one disappears. So uh, you eliminate a, a term from the, from the variance. You reduce the variance from a theoretical point of view. For the other constant, instead, we what we what we can say is that we we find via simulations that the optimal value with some uh, uh, relevant parameters is uh, around uh, one uh, um, so one multiplied by by square root two to pi. So in this, I mean, you could address this from uh, from a theoretical point of view and find uh, CM that. Uh, uh, minimizes this expression. But to do that, you need an estimate of uh, the vol of vol, an estimate of the consistent estimate of the leverage uh, uh, square, and a consistent estimate to this uh, third power of the volatility. But you really, you don't have uh, precise estimators uh, uh, so far, especially of this one and this one. Okay, we are working on the vol of vol, but uh, I think it would be uh, very hard uh, to obtain some consistent estimators of these other processes. So uh, uh, the next uh, uh, best thing is to, to use some simulations and to see more or less where is the region to select uh, CM. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions or comment, maybe it is uh, seven minutes past one. So I thank all the speaker of uh, the this morning and uh, I invite you to join at uh, five. Yes, Elisa? Yes, at five o'clock. Uh, let, me, let me check, but I think it's uh, five o'clock. Yes. I think it's uh, five o'clock this afternoon. Yes, because uh, we have a speaker from uh, Seattle, so uh, yes, uh, we have the, the, the interesting talk by, the, by Matt Lori. Okay, about uh, the replication of uh, volatility derivatives. 
Well, perfect. So thank you for this morning and uh, we meet at five o'clock. Thank, thank, thank you very much.